so you started mountain biking a couple of years ago. Yeah. Right after, actually right after Tony died, I like, uh, I quit drinking right after Tony died and, uh, started mountain biking a lot and, and had a just, I mean, I got like, you know, I, I tried to, I tend to overdo it with everything. So mellow, like trail mountain biking on the fire roads quickly turned into like enduro charging on these like DIY kind of ridiculous enduro courses that they build around here that are totally unpredictable and like really unpredictable lips on the jumps and stuff like that. And I ended up just hammering one of these things and had just a horrific crash. I <laughs> broke my nose. My nose was sideways. I was all torn up. I made my way back to the main trail and these two Russian guys actually helped me out. <laughs> you know, you're in bad shape when the Russian guys have to help you out. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. But the difference, the profound difference in like having that fall at 44, as opposed to the last time I had ridden when I was young is it's unreal. I'd never broken anything. I'd never even hurt myself. And it's like, I just shattered on the ground. It was like dropping <laughs> like a China plate. Oh, so bad. It's so bad. So this is a perfect way to segue and we'll get to the bio in a second. Yeah, sure. So you are or at points have have been and have also self-described as a very physical shooter. And if I'm remembering correctly, yeah. please please call BS on me if I'm misremembering, but you told me a story about running, I want to say on a football field while filming. Yeah. Could you just briefly tell that story to give people an idea of what physical shooter <laughs> means? Give you might you might give an additional example after that, but I just remember almost losing my lunch with that one. So why don't we start there? Well, this was kind of the depressing example. <laughs> but uh yeah, we were we were shooting a documentary, me and my longtime friend Todd Lubin, who I'm still in contact with, we're shooting a documentary in two thousand three on a football team in South Carolina, coastal Carolina, who's gone on to become like D2 champions. I mean, they're like mm. players in the NFL and stuff. It's a really good program now. But uh, I was trying to run sprints while holding the camera sideways along with, you know, the players as they were running sprints. I started with like the O-line and it's like the O-line guys, you can keep up with the O-line guys, right? And <laughs> so I got all cocky feeling like I was like hot shit running with the O-line guys who were like, I'm 15 years <laughs> older than. I tried to run with the running backs. It was like I was racing a, a Ferrari in a shopping cart. <laughs> so I'm running down the side and I stepped in a hole and just oh. obliterated my knee, just blew it to shreds. But the dumbest thing I did was I went, I flew to New Hampshire. I got an MRI and flew back and finished the show. I shot another two months on, oh. the, on the knee before getting surgery. And I regret it every day. Because it's just, I, I mean, it's just a disaster now. I didn't know that oh. everything's amplified when you get older, you know? Yeah. You ever climbed up the top of a mast on a sailboat when you're out at sea? <laughs> I wish I could say yes, but I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've done this more than once. It, but it, it's kind of mellow when you're on the deck. You're kind of rolling and stuff. And when you realize you're at the top of a 60-foot mast, those, the little bit of rolling there is like these massive 20-foot swings, swings back and forth. And you just get shredded. That's what growing old is with injuries. At the point of injury, it was kind of mellow. You know, I was like, oh, I can roll with this. Yeah. I'm tough. You know, I got tons of hormones still like producing in my body. I, you know, I can do anything. I didn't, I just didn't realize that at 46 now, the, the effect of that would be so amplified that, uh, that I basically spend my life limping around, you know? Well, you and me both. You and me both, but I feel like you have you have better stories to tell. Most of mine are just from terrible decisions and questionable circumstances. But before we get any further, let me just read this bio, which was fun to read because I don't I don't know if I've actually read a bio of yours before. <laughs> Obviously, we've spent some time together. But let me let me just jump into this. All right. So, Morgan Fallon on Twitter at Diamond Mo Fallon is a nine-time Emmy nominated executive producer director and cinematographer who's born and raised in New England and studied film at Emerson College in Boston. First question is probably going to be what you learned and did not learn in your film courses at Emerson. After graduating, he spent three years working for his mentor, director Michael Mann. And in 2007, he began a long-term working relationship with producers Chris Collins and Lydia Tenalia and their New York-based production company, Zero Point Zero Productions. Through his tenure at ZPZ, Fallon focused primarily on work with ZPZ creative partner Anthony Bourdain on several episodic series and documentaries produced by Bourdain, including the Emmy-winning Mind of a Chef, 
the theatrically distributed documentary The Last Magnificent, and the Emmy, Peabody, PGA, TCA, and ACE award-winning series Anthony Bourdain, Parts Unknown, which Fallon shot, directed, and produced throughout the series' 103-episode run. Currently, he is a director and executive producer for the Emmy-winning series United Shades of America with W. Kamau Bell. He lives in California with his wife and production partner, Jillian Brown, and his two children. You can find him, like I mentioned, on Twitter, at Diamond Mo Fallon, Instagram, at Fallon.Morgan, and I'll include the Facebook and everything else in the show notes. And the website for 0.0 is 0.0.com. And now we're back. So Morgan, nice. a.k.a. Yeah. Mo, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. You have seen me read a lot of scripts and look into a lot of lights. And maybe we'll cover some of that ground. And do a lot of stuff. We did a lot of stuff. I mean, you were, I mean, you talk about physical shooter, like oh, <laughs> you were, you were headlong into that project. Well, you know, you want to talk about like things that you roll with and then you realize now you're at the top of the mast and in, in a squall. That parkour episode, which was the first exactly. episode, yeah. I am still fixing injuries from that episode oh, 100%. <laughs> of, the, of the Tiferous Experiment. Oh, God. And it just seemed like such a great idea at the time. I know, but you're jumping in with people who had been doing that forever. And those kind of athletes, when they get to that point, they're like a purpose-built race car. Yeah. That's, oh, yeah. That is what they are designed for. And oh, yeah. to jump into that was, yeah, it was a lot. You did it, though. <laughs> That's it's, that is one of the more generous ways to put it. Yes, I did it, and <laughs> slowly rebuilding my body. However, many years later, so Emerson College right. studying film. Yes, why did you choose to study film, and what were the most important things that perhaps you learned, if any, and the most important things that you did not learn? And we we could take a piecemeal. Also, we don't have to answer all of it. I think the story for me is like a lot of people in creative fields. It goes back, you know, far beyond college to to my initial introduction to school and education and kind of figuring out that like my brain style didn't really jive with what people were asking me to do. So the academic portion of school was always really difficult for me. And then I found art. And so art was always a huge part of my life that goes up through high school. I was actually, I was originally, I was going to do ceramics. I was like headed to Alfred university and and I wanted to do ceramics and did that a lot in high school and actually had like pieces in the national art show and stuff. So I'm just, you know, still pretty proud of that. But at some point I started doing math and ceramics, you know, listen, no shade on ceramics. And you climb to the top of that ladder, like any other ladder, you can make a lot of money, but you know, it's not exactly the best life plan, I guess. And the other thing is I wanted to do something. I wanted to be in a medium that, that had power, you know, that had power to tell stories, to, to inform people to, I, I mean, I grew up, I grew up with two kind of bleeding heart, liberal teachers in my family. And my mom was a writing teacher and she focused on teaching writing through using film. So she was using like Pink Floyd, The Wall, Deliverance, Apocalypse Now, you know, <laughs> do the right thing. <laughs> Deliverance is intense. <laughs> pretty heavy <laughs> stuff. <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? She, she was using pretty st- heavy stuff with high school students to kind of grow ideas and to teach critical thinking and all those things. And I wanted to be. Okay. All right. I'm glad you mentioned the time frame. Yeah. Like high school, I'm imagining like teaching little Timmy in third grade no, no, how no, to no, do no. his cursive age with deliverance. Age appropriate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, okay. Age appropriate. Age appropriate stuff. Well, I mean, kind of age appropriate. I don't know. Deliverance, like, I don't know. Some high school students, maybe some high school students, maybe not. But it, that introduced me to film and introduced me to the idea that film could be more than just the art form or the the money making enterprise that it could be actually a way to talk about you know issues that are going on in our culture a way to reflect on ourselves as humans and i wanted to be a part of telling those stories so i just pivoted from ceramics which is the original goal to filmmaking i mean mm-hmm. i had jaws i love that movie and i i had jaws on uh, vhs tape i recorded it off of hbo right Mm-hmm. I watched that movie so many times I broke the VHS tape. So uh, there was like a love for the art form before I even knew what the art form was. 
and I wanted to chase that. So I went to Emerson. It's the only school in the end. It was the only school that I actually sent an application to. They denied me. And I got in my car because I lived in New Hampshire. I got in my car. I drove down to Boston and went to the admissions department. I was like, why'd you deny me? (laughs) And they put me in a room and I talked to someone. And at the end of the meeting, she left and she came back in and she said, cool. You want to come to Emerson? Come to Emerson. That's incredible. I couldn't believe it. (laughs) So after the, I can't believe you denied me. Why'd you deny me? What was there a plan going into it? Why do you think they let you in? Was it just the sheer fact that you were there in person and wouldn't leave? I think that's exactly it. You know, we work in an industry where like tenacity is kind of the key ingredient, right? I was a total fuck up in so many ways. (laughs) And I didn't know my ass from my elbow, but I was, I was tenacious enough to go down there and basically demand that they save a bed for me. I do think in the meeting at some point I said, I said, you better save a bed because I'm showing up. And, (laughs) and I, I just think she likes that. You know? Yeah. It was great. Yeah. I wish I knew who that was. I wish I knew that admissions person because I do have to kind of thank them. Yeah. So, yeah, they saved me a bed. It was great. They read the tea leaves correctly, too. <laughs> you know, in a sense, right? Yeah. I, yeah, definitely. A couple uh, turns I didn't expect in the road there, but yeah, for sure. No, no doubt. Did you learn what you were hoping to learn in school? I I mean, honestly, going into college, I'm not even sure I knew what I wanted to learn. I had like these really weird conceptions of what the industry was. I I still kind of pictured it as like, I don't know. I I pictured it in terms of, I kind of want to crawl out of my small town context and live in some big glitzy kind of space, you know, and I think that's what I thought Hollywood was. And so like, that was, that was kind of the goal originally. And, and you like quickly learn that that, (laughs) that's not really how it rolls. (laughs) But here's the thing about Emerson college and in like, it's, it is a really great school in a lot of ways. They put you, they put you on set. And so Emerson's kind of known for building technicians. And what I learned that I don't know that I went in wanting to learn, but was the most valuable thing is I learned how to be on set. I learned how to use everything on set. I learned how to do everything on set. That's a rarity. A lot of film school is just theory. This was like hands-on. And that allowed me to go out and like actually start doing stuff. And little did I know that my particular little niche of this industry in the end would require me to know how to do everything. (laughs) So I learned that. I guess I kind of believe in that. I believe in that aspect of going to college. And, and I know there's a lot of people out there that think you don't have to go to film school. And I guess I would kind of agree with that too. I think that yeah. you can go out and you work in the industry and you'll learn what you need to learn. A lot of different ways, different paths to approach it. And post-graduation, all right, so you've spent three years working for your mentor, director Michael Mann. Right. Maybe you can, for people who have no context, A, kind of explain in brief who Michael Mann is now, and then at that time, who Michael Mann was and how that actually came to be that you were working with him. I was extremely lucky because, I mean, like literally going out of school, I was like, I want to work for Michael Mann or Terrence Malick or Martin Scorsese. <laughs> it was like, <laughs> this thing just fell into my lap. Who, who Michael is, is... And I think the most important thing to note about who he is and who he was then is Michael was one of the few like truly powerful directors that was left in Hollywood. There's obviously a few now, but the kind of the the age of of the Peck and Paws, these these incredibly powerful juggernaut directors is kind of like come and gone. What is Peck and Paws? I don't know what that is. Oh, like, like Sam Peckinpah is like a very famous director. Think of like the Wild Bunch. Yeah, okay, got it. These very, very powerful, huge personalities that can drive a set with 300 extras and explosions mm-hmm. and massive camera teams and just the big, think of the big 70s kind of films, you know, and these directors yeah. who were so just so big and so powerful that they could drive all of that. Well, Michael was that. And even at the time that I started working for him, which was in 2000. And so he still had the, the power to, to go against the studio, right? To say like, no, this is, 
when you say power, I'd love to hear you elaborate on that. Does it like in, in terms of like leverage because of past performance, just sheer personality and stubbornness where people will fold and allow him to do what he wants to do. I, I don't I'd love to hear you yeah, describe. A little bit of all of those things. And I mean, I think what he did really well and was really smart about was he always had the talent on his side. Mm -hmm. Actors felt safe with him. His track record was obviously just incredible. I mean, you think of a film like The Insider and what he was able to do with Russell Crowe, who's obviously a brilliant actor, but like, look at that character in The Insider and look at what mm -hmm. Michael was able to build. And so he had the trust of, of actors. And when you have the trust of actors at that level, and the actors are like people like Russell Crowe and Will Smith and Tom Cruise, you have a lot of power. So that's one thing he had. But he also, and I think this is like a thing that people don't understand a lot about directing, is like it takes a level of, of discipline and drive and energy and fortitude that is that is not within the scope of normal human existence to make these films to <laughs> to, to pilot a, a 150 million dollar film a 200 million dollar film to be in charge of something that is so big and so sweeping and epic and i i worked with michael on the on the making of ali right so we were what i think 130 something like that was the end budget but we had nights. I mean, we had a night in Mozambique where we had 15,000 extras. Yeah. And think about that. And he's at the helm of all that. And he has to hold all that together. And he has to keep focus, keep straight, keep drive, keep the actors in there, keep the crew in there. All of that stuff. That takes a truly unique person. Usually takes a total fucking tyrant as well. Yeah. And yeah. he would fall into that category also. Those kind of directors are kind of less and less because the studios the studios have quite a bit of control now right and so the studio it's it's more kind of decision by committee now yeah you know you have very powerful studio heads you have very powerful executive producers within the studios and so i think that there's fewer and fewer of the directors I mean, I guess Paul Thomas Anderson would be like a modern kind of example of this who can go in and say, like, this is the film. This is the story. This is my vision. This is what we're going to execute. And you're not going to fucking touch it. Yeah. And that's rare. And Michael had that. How did you get the job with Michael? And actually, two questions. Maybe we can back up. So, so you yeah. said, I want to work for Michael Mann, a name I didn't recognize, or Martin Scorsese. Terrence Malick. Who is Terrence Malick? And why those three, in your mind? Terrence Malick is Thin Red Line. Mm. And he just has a way of making these in incredibly articulate films that almost feel like visual poems, you know? But a very powerful director and someone who was able to really exercise the the medium of film and like use all of all of the tools and spend like, I mean this anyone who works in the industry will know how hard it is to get 45 seconds of silence into a yeah. into a film or into a television show or into everything where you can just absorb the the natural space or absorb the characters going through something or it, it's mm -hmm. like you constantly need to be packing action and you constantly need to be packing information you constantly need to be feeding and feeding and feeding right and what I really loved about his films, like if you watch his films, he has these beautiful little detailed, nuanced moments, you know, within the film that are just hard to achieve. I mean, Martin Scorsese is Martin Scorsese. He directed probably the greatest American film ever made, which is Goodfellas, I believe. I think it was Tony's favorite as well. It's, I agree with him. Mm. It's a masterpiece. And then, but Michael, I really, I loved Insider and I loved Heat. And I love, I think that the last sequence in Last of the Mohicans oh, yeah. is one of the masterpieces of, of filmmaking. It's, it's yeah. technically perfect. I just rewatched Last of the Mohicans recently because I read the book for the first time. And oh, that's cool. Yeah, it was. It was Isn't it amazing? It's just incredible. So that's Michael. 
Mm. You know, so Michael did Last of the Mohicans, and uh, it's a it's a good film. I like I like the rest of the film, but from the moment that they leave the village where they burn the I forget his name, the British soldier, mm-hmm. and he chases them up into the hills. Yeah, it's yeah. it's perfect. It's perfect. He doesn't miss a beat in that. It's beautifully, really beautifully conceived and beautifully shot, and also creatively deviates from the book in a bunch of really interesting ways. And so at some point, I would love to talk to like the screenwriter. And I mean, this is a fantasy, right? Sit at dinner, have some wine with like the screenwriter. Mike will be like, I know it was a long time ago, but let's talk about it. (laughs) All right. So how did you get the job with Michael? It's totally random. I just got, I got a phone call one day. What? Well, why did they know who the hell you were? Because I, it was, I got a call from someone who I had known at Emerson. Right. And it just said, Hey, they need a temporary office assistant for three days. I can't take the job. It's Michael Mann's office. Do you want to do it? I was like, You fucking kidding? Yeah. Like, absolutely. (laughs) And I got in that office and I look back now and I'm like, They must have all thought I was just totally out of my mind. But like, I didn't, I didn't leave. I I forget what I left. I left at like 1130 at night or something. I stayed. I like stayed after. I like cleaned the whole copy room. I organized the fridge. I I just did anything I could. (laughs) I was like, I'm doing anything I can to stay in this office. Yeah. And I did. And at the end of the three days, they're like, yeah, we got a film coming up. Do you you want to be a PA on the film? Of course. So I took that. Wow. Where it really turned, though, is that Michael had an assistant and I was there and I was like the runner and the office lackey. But but I knew I knew stuff like I because of Emerson, like I said, I, I knew how to run cameras. I knew how to run systems. I knew how to do a lot of stuff. And I had a, a solid base of understanding filmmaking. Right. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and the other thing I did is when I got in there, I, I asked for the research material and they were like, Hey, read this book, read this book, read this book. And I just went and read them all. And so I knew how to do all these things. And eventually I'd start, you know, I started setting up the rentals on cameras and stuff like that. Right. And then, you know, their video cameras, none of these cats know how to use them. These older filmmaking cats you know yeah. like michael and his generation they didn't they look at a video camera it's like they had no <laughs> idea what to do with these things so he's like oh you know how to run it and i'm like yeah i know how to run all this stuff you know and he's like okay come down to the gym where we're training with will and you can help me set these things up and stuff like that so i would basically just set these cameras up and hand them to michael and and every once in a while <laughs> lift my head up and be like oh my god i'm standing in a room with will smith and michael mann and and then eventually like, some Ali came by and like hanging out with Ali and then Darius Kanji, <laughs> who's a very famous cinematographer, was there. And I remember one day Darius Kanji, who I was like, these cats are like my idols when I'm in film school, yeah. right? Darius Kanji shot Delicatessen. Yeah. Like Darius Kanji came up to me. He's like, he's like, hey man, he's like, don't tell anyone, but I have no idea how to use this camera. I'm like, I'm like oh, okay, cool. <laughs> so I like dial it in for him. I'm like, you're all good, man. Just ask me. By doing that stuff and reading the research material, like eventually Michael kind of pulled me more and more in. And then I remember one night, I still feel kind of bad for this kid, but it was such a bad call. He had this assistant and the assistant went to a Roger Waters concert and left me alone with him. I'm like, dude, you just you just left the fox in the hen house, man. Like you closed the door behind you. Like I am going to fucking destroy you. So I stayed and I stayed and eventually Michael comes out and he's like, he's like, where's, you know, so-and-so. And I'm like, Oh, he went to a concert. And he's like, Oh, he went to a concert. I was like, yeah, yep. I'm here. And he's like, yeah, but you don't know any of the stuff. He's like, I need this quote from the David Remnick book. And I was like, actually, I read that book and I know right where that quote is and I'll get it for you right now. And I went down and made the photocopy and, I, I don't know, a week later, that kid's moving his shit out of his desk and I'm moving into his <laughs> desk. And it was that cold. And I went on this uh, incredible ride with him. Wow. I was going to ask you, I was going to ask you how the research materials came in. A couple months after that, I was like in Africa with them. Wow. So from the three-day office assistant, yeah. that has to be a world, world record pole vault <laughs> into like a whole different stratosphere of responsibilities. That's just incredible. I mean, what a story. That was amazing. It was amazing. And he handed me also, like being his assistant, he handed me responsibility over all the creative materials. So listen, I, I, 
Michael's he's a very very difficult person. He can be cruel. He can be incredibly cold to people who have been loyal to him for years. There's a lot of ugliness there and a lot of stuff that eventually I was like, you know, I don't want to be that kind of person. And I still feel that way. But I can't you can't but respect him to the <laughs> highest degree as as a creative. I've never seen someone with so much creative energy and so much drive. It was like all of a sudden just being in a different universe mm. where I at 24 was using every ounce of energy I had to keep up with this man who is 60. <laughs> That's the difference. That's the difference, yeah. you know, with someone like him. But he handed me this, like he would keep these running notes that were thousands of pages long, these huge volumes, mm. huge three ring binders where he had thousands of pages of, of creative notes that he had made on every scene. And he handed me responsibility for all that stuff. And so it, a lot of what I was doing was a, like a look into someone who's operating at the very highest level, who's arguably a master of their craft. It was incredible. I mean, it was, it was amazing. Wow. And I was next to him for every second of it. That's incredible. The research materials. So I see how the research materials ended up being helpful. Did you request the research materials because you thought there might be an opening like that? Or was there a different reason for you requesting? I was like, I'm, I have a foothold here and I am going to live and breathe whatever I can that this man lives and breathes. And I'm good just <laughs> because I'm here and I'm 24 and I got yeah. just like full of energy. I do think that they probably thought I was a, like a speed freak though. I think they probably <laughs> thought I was like either a cokehead or a speed freak. I wasn't. <laughs> But I was just so charged up and so full of energy that I just did all these things. Yeah, just total immersion. It was amazing. How did television enter the fray, so to speak? How, how did you then become involved with television? That was the weird thing. It's like my career took a very a very weird kind of turn there. Like I, I, I finished working for Michael. What I had done while I was with him, they, they handed me a video camera. Cause they're like, well, you're here for everything. So just keep the camera on you film what you can in terms of like a behind the scenes type of thing. Exactly. I ended up filming quite a bit of that and they were producing a documentary for HBO on the making of the film. And it ended up being that 50% of the footage and the end result was mine. Which film was this? Just uh, you may have already mentioned Ali. Oh, that was Ali. Yeah, that was the film. The film was Ali. Yep. And so I had filmed all this stuff. They ended up using a lot of it. The producer came up to me and she said, "Hey, listen, we get a lot of footage from assistants, and it's it always sucks. Your footage is actually really good. We use quite a bit of it. You might mm -hmm. think about this as this is a skill you have. At the same time, you know, young in Hollywood." There's a lot of temptation. <laughs> I might need you to elaborate on that. What does that mean? Just the vices of Hollywood? In the end, I got pretty deep on just alcohol and partying and a lot of stuff. Got a, like caught a DUI, broke up with my girlfriend at the time, stopped working for Michael. Things just kind of fell apart a little bit, but I always had the camera. You know, and so yeah. I ended up where I ended up like, and picture this, I'm like, one day I'm flying around in Gulfstream fives with Michael and Will Smith. And I had dinner at fucking Nelson Mandela's house in Mozambique. Like picture that. You know, 24 hanging out with Nelson Mandela. <laughs> Quick interjection. Correct me if I'm wrong. So you grew up partially, at least in West Virginia in an old farmhouse with no electricity. Am I making that up or is that legitimate? That's true. That's true. When I was much younger, though. Yeah. yeah. So, so I'm just painting yeah. the contrast since you're mentioning flying around in a G5. It's a good thing to paint because West Virginia comes full circle in this story of my life, too. <laughs> so West Virginia that still has a place in my heart. I'll elaborate on that in a bit. So, so yeah, one day I'm flying around in Gulfstream and you know, hanging out with Nelson Mandela. And the next day I'm like in my parents' basement back in the middle of winter in New Hampshire, like a broke <laughs> ass, bombed out alcoholic, like, dude, you got to put your life back together. And, and so I ended up teaching a film class for my dad who ran summer programs at this private school that I grew up at. 
and saved up enough money to buy a camera. And then I just started shooting from the very bottom, you know, and I just started again. What did you start shooting? What did you start shooting? I was literally shooting like America's most fantabulous homes and stuff like that. Were you finding the gigs in New York or how did you find the gigs at that point? Again, my, my friend, the same friend that I shot the documentary on the football team with, my buddy Todd Lubin, reached out to me. And, and it, there's a number of times in my career and in my life that Todd reached out to me and was like, hey, you should come do this. A couple of life-changing kind of moments. So he reached out. He hooked me up with these gigs, uh, you know, making not much money. I didn't have a license. I lived in New Hampshire. Most of the jobs are in New York. I'd have to like take a bus to like South Station in Boston with all my equipment and all these huge Pelican cases, get on the train, go down to New York, shoot these things, get back. I was hustling. Yeah. And eventually rebuilt it. And you know how it is. You get better and better projects. You get kind of known for things. You meet people. Your network starts to spread. The time with Michael was almost like an appetizer, like an amuse bouche, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and and then the real work came of building something from the from scratch again. Yeah, building from the bottom. But that taught me that taught me how to be tough, and it taught me how to shoot, and it taught me how to be scrappy. And most of all, and the thing that ended up paying off the most when I got down the road with Tony and stuff is I learned how to make something out of nothing. You know, because when you're like with Michael and on the projects like that, you got all these resources, huge budgets, yeah. like you know, huge yeah, totally. huge stuff. When you're working on the kind of stuff that I do. It's a knife fight. You're <laughs> intentionally small. You don't operate with big crews. You operate with small crews. You don't want to freak people out. I don't work with actors. I work with people. You got you to gotta have a light touch. You got to go in. You got to figure out how to pull the most value out of, out of things with the fewest amount of resources. Yeah, totally. How did you and then end up connecting with Chris and Lydia at ZPZ? Again, in, in kind of working my way back up through the ranks by like 2000 and I guess it was 2006, I shot this show in Buffalo called Tough Love. <laughs> it was like, it was a dark <laughs> romantic comedy about a matchmaker set in Buffalo. I lived in Buffalo for six months in the winter, which is, I, I mean, hats off to anyone in Buffalo. You are, you are tough people. <laughs> <laughs> and the DP on that show was someone named Zach Zamboni, who is a, absolutely a, just a phenomenal, gifted DP who understands this genre better than anyone else I know. When I say this genre, I mean like the verite documentary right. genre. He ended up giving my name to Chris and Lydia because he had been working for them and was at that time working for Tony on No Reservations. They hired me for a couple of jobs, and and that's how I got in with them. And and so I owe wow. a tremendous amount to Zach. I still talk to him all the time, as much as possible. And yeah, he's he's. I, what can you say about him? He's a, he's the master. Sounds like a mensch too, along with along with Todd. Yeah. Question about working your way back up. So if we do now, just a mini flashback. Yeah. You're taking a, all sorts of different projects. Anything. <laughs> okay, so anything, whatever you can anything. get. However, you, yeah, I know you're also a very smart guy. One could say what happened with Michael Mann was one part luck, but it was also like many other, required many other ingredients for that to actually coalesce into what it did. As you were working your way back up, was there any particular strategy about how, let's say, past the halfway point before you get to ZPZ about how you chose projects or anything like that? Or was it really just throw as much against the wall and hope there is some synchronicity? It was definitely throw as much against the wall as possible. But I think that, I think that a marker of many people's careers is certainly not, you know, not like my philosophy or anything like that, but I'm like kind of like, I don't know, like a trapdoor spider or something. You know, you sit there, you're kind of like patient, <laughs> you're grinding out the days when the cricket comes by, you grab it. And that's the moment. When the assistant goes to the concert. <laughs> gotcha, bitch. Come on, dude. <laughs> Come on, man. Like, I mean, rules of engagement. That's legitimate. That is a terminal move that he made. I, 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 I agree. I mean, who does he think he's working for? It was stunning to me that he allowed that opening. Yeah. And for Roger Waters, which like respect, but it's not Pink Floyd. Yeah, yeah. 
<laughs> I think that it's just knowing those moments and like there are career changing moments and it's sometimes just a phone call and it's like out of the blue and you're like, oh, this is the moment. This is the thing. This is the project. When I got turned on to ZPZ and Chris and Lydia, that was like very clearly it. And I had, and I was very aware of Tony and no reservations at that point and was like, that is what I want to do. I want to do that, you know? And so when they came into the picture, I was like, oh, you, I mean, yeah, I'm going to do anything that it takes. Put me on any project you want and I will prove to you I deserve to be on that ride and, and working with Tony. And that's what I tried to do. So how did you go about trying to do it? What did the first, okay. first date look like? First thing I did for them was show for PBS called Diary of a Foodie. Which was a great show. It was a beautiful show. And so, you know, what did I do? I, you know, show up on time, work your ass off, shoot good footage, don't be a pain in the ass, keep your head low, figure out the lay of the land, don't come in like you own the place. I don't know, the basics. Yeah. Luckily, learned how to do that shit from my dad. You know, he taught me how to work hard. And so, like, when the opportunity, and I don't think that I've been like someone in my, career i mean there are people a lot of people in this industry that are like just way more calculated and machiavellian about how they go about they see it way way down the road they know where they're headed they know the strategy to get there that's impressive to me i can't do that i see the thing come i grab it you know and like that's what happened with that i knew that i wanted to work with tony i saw a window and i just was not going to leave so I, I guess that's it. Same thing with kind of showing up at Emerson and telling them that I'm coming regardless of whether they have a bed yeah. for me or not, I guess. <laughs> Part of what prompted me to reach back out, and I think I said this in the text, was I had an international flight and I watched Roadrunner, this documentary yeah. about Anthony Bourdain, Tony Bourdain. And I thought it was to the extent that I could even assess it because I, I didn't know him, but I thought it was well done. It wasn't, it didn't seem one dimensional in the sense that they, they, they really approach it from many different perspectives. I would be curious to know what you thought was, if you have any opinion, like what you thought was important for them to include that they included. And then perhaps what you would have liked to have seen more of or mentioned. I'm stoked to talk about Roadrunner. We should back up at some point on the ZPZ stuff because there's a there's a bunch of stuff that happened in between there, which is Steve. And we should talk about Steve. Oh, yeah. We're definitely going to do that. Roadrunner. It was directed by Morgan Neville, who's one of the great documentary filmmakers out there right now. And what I would say about Roadrunner and a lot of different people, like, by the way, I should specify, like, there were a lot of people that worked for Tony and, and a lot of people that were really close with him. It is I, in no way am I like the, the person or a singular kind of thing there. There was a lot of people that were really close to Tony and went on the ride with him. And I'm sure a lot of them have different opinions about, about Roadrunner. For me, when I watch that film, and I've only seen it once, I may only ever see it once. You know, it's, it's hard. It's hard for me to watch it again. What I saw, I think that what they did was as good a job as you could do with that subject without having been on the inside of it. Yeah. Which I guess is in some ways, I mean that in, is, is kind of the greatest compliment I can give. Because I think that there were things that were missed, but I think that there are things that you kind of had to really be there and know him and have gone through that experience to really, you know, to really fully grasp and understand. And I think they did a really good job of, of getting who he was and getting what that journey was. And as far as things I wish they had leaned into more and away from more, I, I, I do wish they had gotten a little bit more of who Tony was in terms of his relationship to to people in the way he approached people, the way he approached the world. Yes, he was, he was a, a champion of the underdog and they mentioned that in the film, but it was, it was more than that. Like 
Tony really, really deeply felt, I think, a connection to, to people whose environments he was walking into. And he felt that connection as a guest. But he was the kind of person who would like wade into a room and pick up a baby and, you know, sit in someone's living room and really actually kind of be there, you know, and be with them and be with them on their, like on their terms. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the kind of the intangibles about him. Yeah. He was a very connected person to the world for someone who is like as (laughs) strangely agoraphobic as he was, he had an amazing ability to be truly like connected and in the moment and see the beauty in things that are often passed up in to see the, like the beauty in people and in the small nuances and details of their life. And I don't know, I guess, so I guess that a little more of that and a little less of the kind of whodunit aspect of Tony's suicide, you know, I understand going down that road for sure. And like, I, in who am I to talk? I contributed as much to that as anyone else through my interview, you know, but it is not the defining characteristic of who Tony was. There's, there are so many others that, that I, that I feel could have, I guess, played a little bigger. Yeah. It makes sense. It's well done though. And, and we'll, we'll certainly come back to Tony. So you mentioned, ZPZ. Let's talk about ZPZ and Steve. So who is Steve and and what do these chapters look like? So I came in on foodies and then did a couple of no reservations with Tony and those were great. So I, I the first one I got called to replace someone on the Egypt show with Tony and I got along with him, which was kind of amazing. And I guess I didn't know at the time, I didn't know it was anything special, but I got a call after from Lydia and she's like, he knows your name. This is a benchmark moment. I was like, Oh, okay, cool. So I went to Egypt with them and, and we had a great show. I did a few other, no reservations was like getting to know Tony, but then they called me. I was working at the time again for my buddy, Todd, who was show running biggest loser. And I had shot 96 episodes of Biggest Loser, which is uh, real formatty reality TV with a little more puking than normal reality TV. (laughs) But I'd done that for three years. And really, I learned like how to shoot on that thing because you're just grinding out like you have a camera on your shoulder for like 10 hours a day and you are just grinding out like shooting. You know, it's the same stuff over and over again, but you're like, you'll really learn it. I got a call and they're like, we have this guy, Steve Ranella, who like, he's got a really interesting story. He's like, he lives in Brooklyn, but he hunts for his food. He's a conservationist and a hunter and a writer. And he's a really smart guy and you should meet him. I think you'd get along with him. And so I, I go and meet Steve in a parking lot in Michigan. And within 35 minutes, I am this deep in a swamp, you know, up to my shoulders in a swamp, holding the camera above my head as Steve sets turtle traps. And it was just like this moment of like, oh my God, this is, this is it because this is like super experiential. It's super visual. He's incredibly smart, just a fountain of information. As you know, from hanging out with him, it, it's like it never stopped. Yeah. Encyclopedic. It's just unbelievable and so it had all of everything was there you got all of the information you got something that's really smart you got a philosophy behind it that makes sense and yet you're doing stuff that's highly physical that's really cinematic that's really kind of gripping and and kind of hits on like a root human level you're out like doing it you're out like getting food you know so i met him in that swamp and just started like a journey with him. We went on to film eight episodes of a show called wild within, which was, I think like a early attempt to make a hunting show and figure out like what a hunting show could be in terms of also telling a story and having a narrative progression. But some of the, it was really unique in that we were just actually doing the stuff that we said we were going to do. 
I, I remember early on, like a, a producer came on. They're like, okay, where's the line item for the animal wrangler? And Steve's like, fucking animal wrangler. It's like, there's no <laughs> animal wrangler, dude. He's like, we're, we're going to Alberta to hunt moose. He's like, and he's like, well, how do you know you're going to be successful? He's like, I don't. It's hunting. We don't know if we're going to be successful. <laughs> Who's dropping off the moose? No one's dropping off the moose. <laughs> to present that to a network and to be like, well, how are you going to assure us that you come up with something here? We're not. You know, we're going to go out and actually do it. That was that was a lot for a network to get their heads around. But it allowed yeah. us to to be genuine about what we were doing, you know, and I, I really believe like when you, when you watch these shows, people know they know when they're being bullshitted and they know when it's honest. You know, the bullshit is fun to watch. I get it. It draws numbers and people enjoy it. But if you want to build a legacy, you want to build one of these legacy shows. You got to be honest with your audience. That's what they will come back for year after year after year. That's what they're 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 looking for. And that's what Steve provided. And so we went and we did this show that was really unique and I I felt like we had moments that were were unlike anything I had ever seen on TV before. We were like, I mean, we were in it, man, hunting pigs in Hawaii, having the pigs like run up this coolie and get in this little they got in this little stream there where we found them they're like in a fight to the death with the dogs that that had had run them down steve's like in there with a knife trying to stab pig and not dog blood screaming there's mud and shit flying all over the place and I know that that can be very difficult for some people to hear and understand. But for me, I, I had this moment where I was like, well, I feel incredibly connected to like the human experience, to the natural experience. I feel like a part of kind of the whole dynamic. And, you know, we ate pig and we used all of it and we, we were responsible about it. And, So I could kind of, from a philosophical standpoint, I felt like I could get my head around it and understand, oh, this is why this person does this. Had you ever hunted prior to that show or been involved with hunting? Not at all. Never. I like what I realized is like growing up in New Hampshire, I felt like I was outdoorsy. And then I went with Steve to Alaska and I was like, oh, I'm not outdoorsy at all. (laughs) I've never been off a trail. I've never been off like a like a well marked trail, you know. Um, and all of a sudden, you're standing in the middle of like Prince of Wales Island with Steve. It's fucking pouring rain. You're freezing cold. You're cliff hung because because it's Steve, and something always happens. Wait, what do you mean by cliff hung? What does that mean? <laughs> what is cliff hung? Cliff hung. It usually happens when you're descending, right? But basically, you're say you're descending through heavy cover. And you get out to a cliff, right? And you make a decision, which is like, I can get down this thing. And you go down a drop that you can't come back up. (laughs) And then you realize that the drop, the next drop isn't 15 feet, it's 60 feet. Then you're cliff hung. Oh, shit. (laughs) (laughs) That that sounds like a great situation. Yeah. And you got to figure it out, you know? But it was, but figuring all that stuff out was like, was incredible. Because I, I, again, just, I was just like, I'm just a dude. I didn't come from any kind of special background. I'm not a green beret, you know, (laughs) I was dropped into this thing with no understanding of what my capacities were when I was put into an environment where you have to rely on like your natural instincts and your ability to do shit and your ability to like not get yourself fucking killed, you know, when you're out in the woods. And at first I was like, I can't do this. Can't do this. And I'm, and by the way, I'm, got a 50 pound pack on in a camera all the time. So I got one hand, everyone else got two hands. At first it was terrifying. I remember that first time we got a little bit cliff hung and I'm like, I'm like, where's the sat phone? Let's call the coast guard. Yeah. And they're like, they're like, dude, we don't call the coast guard over this. Trust me, you're going to be okay. It, and it was an incredible, an incredible realization to be like, Oh wait, I am going to be okay. I've got all the, all the stuff is innate in being human that I need to like survive this Mm. and to figure it out and to deal with it. Whereas I think a lot of my career up to that point had been like how to navigate the human world and 
be kind of a player in all of that. The like, constructed world. Yeah. That's right. I had never connected with the natural world. And I had no idea that within me and within all of us was this ability to navigate the natural world by simply connecting with stuff that we are born with. Yeah. And Steve, Steve brought that out of me. And once I realized that, then the whole world opened and you're like, oh my God, I'm in the middle of this highly dynamic, highly visual thing that we can just run with. And we can like, no one's, I don't want to say no one's ever done that style of production before, but truthfully, honestly, in the hunting world, they did a lot of like, and you know what it is. They, they sit in a blind, they shoot a bear over a 55 gallon drum of donuts. You know, I, I find all yeah. that shit disgusting. They, they won't even like a lot of these shows won't even finish the episode unless they get a good kill shot. And we were like, fuck kill shots. I don't give a shit about the kill shot. Yeah. We were doing something that just felt so raw and real and unproduced and unscripted that it was very refreshing. And once kind of figured out, Oh, this, you put your feet here, you walk this way, you hold the camera like this. This is how you don't get yourself killed. This is how you don't get yourself hurt. Once we figured all that shit out, or once I figured all that shit out, then you were left with just this incredible canvas to paint on. And I think we did something really special. I think we really put people in that sensory environment, what it feels like to be out there and to be a predator and to be part of this whole dynamic that's always going on around us but that we have largely excised ourselves from and we were there with a camera to capture it i'll be the the first to concur that steve is is as legit as i've seen Me too. certainly having spent time with him for one episode yeah in the in the brooks range which was incredible yeah you got thrown into the deep end <laughs> oh that was that was exciting. Yeah, having the barren, <laughs> barren ground grizzlies charging the camp. Oh my god! And Steve, I remember when uh, when one charged the camp, and it's running yeah. because Giannis spotted it. Yeah. Wait, Giannis is that is that right? Am I getting his name yeah, right? That's correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So Giannis, nickname the Bear Whisperer, I think on that trip, ended up at some point he was just unpacking some gear or something, and then he kind of sat up and he's like, wait a second, grabbed his binoculars. And then lo and behold, he spotted this bear that was on its hind legs, smelling some of our uh, meat. Yeah. And it just comes galloping. This is probably not the right term, but like loping towards us around. Barreling is usually the way I feel about bears. Barreling. Yeah. <laughs> barreling. That's yes, absolutely barreling. And I remember Steve, is being summoned, right? We're all like, Steve, Steve, because half of us are muggles who have never dealt with bears before. Yeah. And Steve comes out of his tent and he's so pissed off because he had he had left his cell phone in the corner of his tent and this mosquito kind of deet liquid had pooled in that side and destroyed his cell phone. And so he's like ranting and raving and fuck this and fuck that. And he's so pissed as this bear is running. He's completely unconcerned. And we're all like, uh, Steve bear, uh, Steve bear, Steve bear. <laughs> and you know, eventually he's like, yeah, 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 yeah. And he like shoots a shotgun in the air and like waves at it and it runs off and like turns around a quarter mile away and just sits there staring at us. And I'm like, now, now what do I do? <laughs> but he is, uh, he is absolutely a hundred percent, absolutely able to walk the talk. In every part of that story, including him destroying his cell phone, it, it rings so true to Steve. <laughs> but <laughs> that's exactly right. I mean, he, he to be with Steve Rinella is to you're with someone who is so so sure footed and so competent in their environment. It is something. It is really something to behold. And I, he kind of shrugs it off when you try to compliment him. But that is one of the toughest, smartest, most solid people I've ever met in my life. You know, yep. I, I, I just can't say enough about uh, about who he is. I was just going to add, incredible human, and also for those people who are like, oh, isn't that the hunting guy on TV? He is also an incredibly talented, and not just talented, because that kind of infers he's born with it out of the box. Maybe some of that is true, but skillful writer. I mean, American Buffalo, excellent, many writer. other books. Excellent writer. That's earned. I mean, sure, like born with a predilection for writing, sure. I'm sure that's true, but He's a writer. I mean, he writes from nine in the morning to five in the afternoon every day. He 
he does the job and and it has made him a great writer and i would say that his voiceover and his writing is some of the best in the industry he's Mm. he's just excellent and has built that that initial show wild within went on I mean, of course it was canceled in the first season because like no network was ever going to be able to really wrap their head around what we were doing. And so we launched a a self-financed endeavor, which was Mediator, which has now grown into this big company that Steve owns or or partially owns or whatever. I don't know exactly what the ownership structure is, but it's grown into this big thing. That was when we did, when we actually went out and did that, that was like the fully formed version of the show. I feel like Wild Within, we were just kind of like learning how to be outside and how to make TV and how to not bullshit people. And trust me, we did a little bit of, little bit of eye rolling bullshit and, and wild within. <laughs> but by the time we got to mediator, we weren't bullshitting anymore. We were just going out mm. and doing it and grinding and we got really good at it. And I just have watched recent episodes now and they're beautiful and smart and just, just excellent high quality TV. And like very, very proud of that, 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 something i was involved in like on that ground level has has maintained that kind of quality is like incredibly rewarding what do you feel like aside from what we've already discussed what skills did you develop or what did you learn from that show that ex- that experience on the show that has ended up transferring to other things helping with other things later the psychological game is everything. I think we have a tendency to to shut down when we feel defeated or to shut down when we feel like like we've reached an impasse, you know. And what's amazing about being in the natural environment like that and and really doing it is that you're forced to face the landscape. You're forced to face the elements you're forced to face weather you're forced to face all these things that are incongruous with producing television and achieving your goal (laughs) and and you don't have the option because you're out alone i mean you know you know how i mean from the brooks range show you know from the care you get dropped off by like a piper cub in the middle of nowhere and they're not coming back for 10 days or however long you were out and so you got to figure all that shit out in between and yeah, we go out with like a lot of tools and stuff, but it's hard not to feel defeated when you're when you're freezing, when you're soaking wet, when you roll out of your sleeping bag in the morning and the reality you're facing is that you got to put on your soaking wet wool underclothes that have been out in, you know, 40 degree weather all night and and it's going to suck and it's going to hurt and it's going to be miserable and cold and depressing. And you got to push through that anyways. I think for me, and I don't know that this is the same for everyone else, you know, but I think for me, that was the greatest thing that I took away from that is like keeping your headspace, keeping your mood elevated, keeping the possibility of something amazing and beautiful and brilliant happening and keeping grinding is the way to to do this specific line of work because we don't get to we again we don't have the resources to control all the variables and we're working with real people in all the work that i do so you're kind of at the whim of a lot of dynamics and you got to learn how to see the things that get in your way as gifts you know you got to learn how to take them and operate around them and move off of them and and use them and that's what that's what I learned out there with Steve. So let's try a segue into the world of Tony. And this may or may not make sense as a segue, but let's let's try it. And then we can go anywhere you want to go. The first time working with Tony in Egypt. Because this this is sort of the what was the term you used? Like a trap spider moment of sorts for you? <laughs> that definitely was. Okay, so let's have you describe what happened in Egypt? So I got the call I was waiting for, which was, hey, you know, one of the shooters can't go to Egypt. I think he got sick or something. And do you have, is your passport up to date? Can you go like next week? And I was like, you know, absolutely. You know, I'm, there's no way I'm missing that. So I went to Egypt. 
I kind of jumped in, you know, that, that show had been going already for a while. And so they had ways of doing things. I tried to do my best to assimilate to the, the ways they were doing things and bring what I could to the table. But the thing that changed it all and like Tony, Tony was, Tony was not like everyone that came in the door. It was like, Hey, how's it going? You know, he's, he plays it cool. And, and the other thing is if he doesn't like you, you are just simply not going anywhere on that show. And there's a lot of people he didn't like, you know, yeah, he had pretty particular, I think if you were honest, I think if you weren't a dick to people, I think that if you carried yourself in a respectable manner, I think that if you, if you saw that you worked hard and I think that if you saw that you could like hang out and like, I have to admit there was a lot of drinking on the show if you could hang out and not become just like a sloppy drunk (laughs) then then you were kind of cool and you could hang out but initially he wasn't going to give you anything the thing that changed it for me with with tony was we were going out we were going to go out and spend a night out in the western desert with the bedouin and and we go we drive you know a few hours outside of cairo we meet them in the desert and you're like on a paved road with just sand on both sides we meet this group of bedouin all in their like late 70s toyota land cruisers which is the car of choice in uh the western desert of egypt and we're just going to go drive off into the desert and i was like well okay so we're driving across the desert i should get up on the roof of one of these cars and just film a bunch of car to car stuff we're driving across the desert how like how bad can it be and so Five minutes later, we're going like 80 miles an hour across the desert. I am absolutely terrified. I have one hand on the camera (laughs) and my other arm, my right arm was around a four post bed that for some reason they had strapped to the roof of the car. And so I have my arm around. Now by four post bed, this is like a bed with a huge canopy above it. Is that what you mean? Like one of those things? Yeah. And it was broken down into pieces. (laughs) They had broken it down into the pieces and strapped it to the roof of the car. I think that they thought that Tony would want to sleep in a four post bed, like out in the desert, (laughs) which is absurd. You know, and like Tony, if you know Tony, like all Tony wants to do is go off and like pass out in the sand, you know? Yeah. So anyways, they had this ridiculous thing on top of the car and it saved my life because I was able to hold on to the car. I, this, whoever the driver was must have been like, I am going to show this white boy, you know? <laughs> and, and so they go barreling off across the desert and, and it is harrowing. And I see Tony looking out the window at this big, ridiculous grin looking at me and like, oh yeah, look at the new guys suffer, you know? Like, this is, this is yeah. great. I got great <laughs> footage and also... The, what I think did it for me is I, by the time we got to camp, I had a hematoma the size of like a small Nerf football on my bicep where I was holding on <laughs> that was like deep purple where I'd been holding. That's how hard I was holding on to this thing. And that's the kind of beating that it took up there. And I think that that act of he's like, oh, this is a cat who's likes it i mean i'm a physical shooter you know this is a cat that's going to throw himself completely into this and it's like a light switch went off i landed in camp he's like hey hey, all right that was a pretty rough ride i was like oh yeah look at this i showed him the bruise and from that moment on tony liked me i got called Uh after that like i said lydia was like this is a benchmark moment he actually knows your name after one show do you want to come back? You want to do another? I was like, I'll do as many as I can for as long as I can. And that's what I did. So that was the introduction to Tony. It just took a act of, I don't know. I didn't have kids at the time, so I don't consider it too selfish, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend it to any young shooters. (laughs) What were some other pivotal moments or episodes for you with, with Tony? I'm thinking one, and we could do something chronologically that happens sooner, but you know, like Ethiopia. Ethiopia was huge, yeah. We could jump into that if you want to just describe. Yeah. So when I came on the show, I was just a camera operator and then worked my way up where I was like the lead camera and a DP on the show. And then I was like, if I don't, if I don't, take the opportunity to try to direct this show and produce this show and do everything that I can on this show, I'm going to regret it. 
And so around, I guess it was around like 2014, I started asking and being like, I really want to direct the show. And I did a season of Mind of a Chef with Magnus Nielsen in Sweden, which was a show that Tony produced. That allowed me to really like showcase like, hey, I can go out there. I can make up eight episodes. I can like lead a show. I can get it done. And it turned out really well, partly because Magnus is like a absolute genius and one of the most fascinating people you can hang out with. He's like on that. He's like with Steve. Just an incredibly dynamic person. I mean, someone who had created like one of the best restaurants in the world out of a what was a moose fondue restaurant in central Sweden. <laughs> imagine, imagine what he started with. Created one of the best <laughs> restaurants in the world by his mid twenties, and was already a master psalm at that point. So, you know, that's who Magnus Nelson is. Yeah, that is incredible. But I did that. Tony saw it, Tony liked it, and agreed to let me direct, and it was Ethiopia with Marcus Samuelson. So if you know Marcus... I know of him. I don't know him pers- yeah, exactly. personally, but certainly know of him. Yeah, Marcus is on tons of cooking shows. You know, He's, he's an incredibly magnanimous, huge smile, wonderful person, tons of energy. But Marcus's story is that he was born in Ethiopia, and his during a... Oh, God, I want to say it was a cholera outbreak. It was an infectious disease outbreak in Ethiopia. Tuberculosis. It's tuberculosis. And Marx's mother walked, he and his sister, when they were just little, little kids, something like 75 miles from her village into Addis and got them to an orphanage and then died. And so Marcus and his sister were adopted and grew up in sweden so this was this show was his return to ethiopia and he had been there before but like it was was also his wife maya who's just an absolutely incredible person and just simply one of the most gorgeous human beings you'll ever meet was also from garage and from one of the more prominent tribes in ethiopia and so it was a return to her village it was a return to find his 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 father and reconnect with his father it was a big show and i was i was terrified <laughs> i don't even i don't even know why it seems irrational at this point but it was it was i was totally terrified what were you terrified of i don't know you know it just i just respected tony so much i love the show so much i you know and i'm someone i you know, I suffer from anxiety disorders. I, you know, I'm bipolar. I, you know, I, I have a few things in my bag, like everyone does to kind of deal with. And it set those off pretty good. But <laughs> I went, I did it. We, we had this in, incredible show. Ethiopia is in, just a totally extraordinary place. Like so many places in, in Africa, totally misunderstood one of the more dynamic environments that you can step into. It's got a, a young population there that is just totally plugged in, totally driven, super hardworking. You know, it's one of those places where you're like, man, if, if the corruption at the top can ever get out of its own way, these people are going to just kill it, you know? But we, yeah, it was an, it was an amazing experience, an amazing experience to like go and, and go back into Maya's home village to find Marcus's father. The funniest part of it was for all the shit that Tony ate through his career, he is like, he just cannot handle Ethiopian food. I love Ethiopian food. Of all things. Of all things. He said he found his kryptonite. And so he was basically Mm. starving to death during the show. I'm begging him to eat cliff bars and stuff like that because he wouldn't eat anything. He was just like wasting away. <laughs> but that was amazing. That was the first show I directed. It was like a huge moment. And Tony was very kind to me. He gave me the benefit of the doubt. How did you prepare for that? And what is, I know this is going to seem like a really elementary, naive question, but. Yeah. What's the difference? Well, I've seen you in action 
with the camera, right? And we're yeah. going to talk more about that just because the the kind of dance involved, especially when you have multiple shooters, yeah, is incredible. I mean, it's yeah. such it's an amazing craft and so much geometry. So we're going to get into yeah. that. But directing in a situation like this seems to represent other skill sets that you had not exercised perhaps as much. So how did Ever. you prepare for this? You don't seem like the guy to just wing it. Directing is like an interesting word to use for these because when you typically think of a director, like you're working in narrative. And so you're, you're working with actors, you're working with the crew, you're storyboarding it out or whatever. That is a very, very, very precise endeavor. This is different. What we do on these shows is, is initially starts with like a ton of research, right? So we're just trying to get our head around the environment. We're trying to understand the dynamics of what's going on, trying to understand what we can and can't do. And we have to be also in a place like Ethiopia, especially you have to be sensitive to the environment. That is a totalitarian government that is 100% watching everything you do. And the people that we work with there are going to be left with the repercussions of what we do and how we behave there. Right. And so you, uh, you know, certain things off the bat where you're like, there's certain stuff that we're not going to do. There's certain boundaries we're not going to try to push. And I, and I, again, hats off to all the people that go and do, do that. I hope they do it carefully and with respect to the people that they're leaving behind. But we were going to be very careful going into an environment like Ethiopia, because I don't want to end up that my PAs or my drivers or my fixer is, is sitting in some dingy prison because of something we did. And that's a, that's a reality there. So it's going in and assessing what you can and can't do, assessing what the boundaries are, knowing the landscape, and then starting to pull out, okay, so this is this very interesting thing. There's this culture of these Asmari there, and they are basically, they're basically minstrels, right? Play this very kind of old fashioned kind of music. It's kind of like a rap where they'll freestyle stuff from the room they used to travel around from village to village but what's really interesting there is they use the asmari as a way to have these kind of coded political discussions right huh. so they have all kinds of nuance and intricacies in the way that they do their kind of freestyle rap that is actually talking about politics in an environment where you can't talk about politics right so we know we're going to you know this is a cool thing we're going to do a scene with them okay where are we going to do that? What's that going to look like? So you're finding different Ismari, you're looking at the locations, you're pulling people in. Okay, so we're going to do the Ismari, but we need some, you know, we want to bring some dancers in. There's another dance troupe over here. We can get them to work together. This is a good environment, you know, this particular place to shoot it. What you're actually trying to do is, is set up an environment that is that is simultaneously real and authentic and also constructed, you know? Yeah. And in a way that we know that the apparatus of television making is going to work. We're actually going to walk away with something that works. The sound's going to be workable. The lighting's going to be workable. You know, we're going to be able to control the environment and not have other kinds of background pollution or other things that are out of our control infecting what we're trying to do. I think Zach Zamboni, who I referenced before, said it best when he said, like, when we make a show about Vietnam, Vietnam doesn't look like that, but Vietnam doesn't not look like that either. These are real mm -hmm. things, but they are filtered through our process of trying to set them up in a way where we can then kind of just give the ship a little push and hope that it crosses the lake. And that's what we're really trying to do is pull those elements together. And that's the directing in terms of like, if you're going to go in and direct Tony, like you think you're going to direct an actor, like that was never going to happen. You maybe <laughs> can get him to ask a couple of questions. And if he spends 45 minutes of his hour long interview talking about John Wick too, you're going to have to kind of like suck it and deal with that, you know, which happens a lot. <laughs> So like the amount of shit that I've heard about John Wick, I was like, I've never even seen it. I, I actually won't watch John Wick because I've heard 
Tony talk about it so many goddamn times <laughs> in moments where I'm like, dude, I need content here. Like we're dying here. I don't have anything to put this scene together. And you're talking about fucking John Wick. Like I won't watch the movies. And I hear they're great. Yeah, uh, that's incredible. That's basically the process of what we're doing. And then you're talking to the the DPs about how we're going to shoot it and what style elements we're going to use, what that's going to look like, et cetera. You know, and this was a show where we you had a lot of film references that we were trying to pack in. What makes someone a, a DP? Maybe we should also just spell out what that stands right. for. And did you interact as a director? Did you interact with the DPs differently than most directors interact with DPs? Definitely. I'm sure it drives them crazy because I have really high expectations because I was a very accomplished DP before. So a DP is a director of photography, cinematographer, shooter, kind of go by all those names. I did really well. That was my thing. I was really good at it. I did really well. And I was, I was known, known for it in my, again, in my little kind of subgenre. So yeah, I interact with the DPs differently because i can see the shots in it and i have a real advantage in that my wife is a director as well she doesn't come from a cinematography side so i I spend a lot of time working with her on like how to see things from a photography standpoint you know and it gives you a real advantage when you can it also will drive your fucking dps crazy because i'm breathing down their neck all the time i'm like yeah is that the best shot maybe stand over there a little bit more you know <laughs> move over that way a little bit tighter you know they're like dude i'm trying to find it so yeah i think i've probably ride them a little harder <laughs> you know i'm right so it's okay <laughs> <laughs> most of the time i'd like to double click on high standards because this is this is fertile territory for all sorts of conversations yeah <laughs> All right. So I want to read something. You can't believe everything you read on the internet, but in the course of doing research for this conversation, I found something on CNN and I'm going to read it and then we can explore it. All right. Would Morgan Fallon, director, cinematographer, and producer of Anthony Bourdain, Parts Unknown, misses most about working with Tony is the pressure. In a recent phone call with CNN Travel, Fallon described Tony's exceedingly high expectations and awe. Indeed, he may have been smiling on the other end of the phone when he explained the editing process for Parts Unknown. You could get absolutely gutted in a rough cut, Fallon said. In other words, Bourdain didn't sugarcoat it, and this approach was appreciated by Fallon and other crew members. The celebrity chef and star producer, quote, was never going to accept anything mediocre, end quote, said Fallon, who was pleased with the workflow. I felt good when Tony was happy with the show, he added. And... You know, I was I was watching, and we don't have to spend a ton of time on this, but this doc uh, that uh, in in some ways prompted me reaching out. You know, Roadrunner, and I, you know, Tony is so human yeah. and so nuanced and like so loving in so many ways, and has really fucking high standards, right? And I yeah. remember at one point when in that doc they're talking about the rough cut, and it, they said something like, "More than once, Tony." Tony told an editor to like unfuck themselves or something like that. Oh, we got told to unfuck ourselves all the time. I got told that on a daily basis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, the mics aren't working. Unfuck yourself. Like, okay. So, so let's talk about different types of high standards, right? Yeah. So like, could you elaborate on Tony's particular species of high standards and if you have any funny stories that's always great but you know any any stories that come to mind are also super helpful and just so you know where this is going i i'm wondering like how it contrasts with say a michael mann or and and i know you i don't think you've had experience with like james cameron but like james cameron another person is really famous for having extremely high standards yeah and uh, you know where the line is between being like brutally direct and turning into something else. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I do. Uh, I'd love to explore that because this is something I struggle with also. So speaking at the very high end, you were speaking about the Michael Manns, the James Camerons, the level of expectation is, is never achievable. They will never, it's never good enough. Right? They, they yeah. do not have a level where it's good enough. It can always be better. You have to be that way. Yes, they are assholes. I will say it straight up. Michael Mann is an asshole. And he's known that way in the industry. But he has to be. 
that is the mm-hmm. only way that you get that caliber of project done. You want to get through a Titanic, you are going to have to be an asshole, 100%. Yeah. And the same is true in, in high caliber kitchens. You want to run, you want to run a high caliber kitchen? There is only one way to do it and you are not friends with your crew. You are you are in charge and it's your responsibility and and I think that Tony Tony approached it from that from that perspective at least initially. He had extremely high expectations that I think were based on his history of knowing how to run an effective kitchen and at the same time he had all kinds of his own like, you know, neuroses and stuff that bled into that. And you see it in Roadrunner. I actually one of the parts I really liked was when he talks about, hey, I'm not gonna stop for the cameras. You guys learn how to get fast. <laughs> you get fast, I do what I do. Yeah. And that was I loved that. Because because I because I could do it. I was fast and I loved working fast like that. So yeah, super high standards. W- with Tony though, different than Michael and James Cameron and I and I have not worked with James Cameron I know a number of people who have though I don't think you're ever going to get that moment with with Michael or with someone like Michael Mann or someone like James Cameron where you're like sitting down and and like drinking beers with them out in the desert and talking about like right. life and things that really mean something and like with Tony you did and that was the difference he was actually he was a friend and and a very, very important friend, you know, who I miss every single day. He was not those guys. He wasn't an asshole. He could be an asshole, you know. He could be an asshole all the time. He could be incredibly frustrating to work with. But he, but there was something under it. There was something very loving there. There was something very caring. And once you were kind of in his sphere, he really, he really did care about people. So from that perspective, it was different. From the work perspective, though, he wasn't going to mince words in the same way that he wasn't going to mince words when a dish isn't right in the kitchen. Like, you can't. It doesn't work that way. Unless you want 20 fucking risottos sent back, you better get the first (laughs) one right. And when someone fucks it up, you better let them know that they fucked it up big time right now, immediately, and correct the problem. And that was a lot of the process with Tony in post for sure. In the field, it was more like things that were cumbersome or inconvenience, Tony. He didn't like messiness. He didn't like sitting around. And like, you know, that when shit goes south on a crew, I mean, my God, we just look like a bunch of look like a bunch of chickens with our heads cut off running around trying to make shit happen or trying to make shit work and there's a lot of reasons that that can happen you know he didn't like any of that and you'd, you'd hear about unfucking yourself quite a bit in those moments but when it came to posts like that's a much more calculated thing yeah and like i would send him rough cuts and everyone has been through this i would send him rough cuts where he i mean from the very beginning he's like what possible reason do you have for presenting me with this piece of garbage? I didn't work so hard, dot, 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 in full caps. You didn't work so hard to have your work flushed down the toilet by this asshole editor, you know? (laughs) And you're like, oh, okay. Are we going to, like, are we going to go in a constructive direction? Like, what do you, you know? And, but he would, and, and, and that's the, that was the thing about him is that the good ones are right. You know, Michael Mann, as much of an asshole as he was to people, you'd have to kind of be like, well, he's right though. (laughs) You know, he's right. (laughs) He knows and he's right. He's not wrong. With Tony, also 90% of the time he was, he was right. And it wasn't up to, it wasn't up to the standards. What was cool about Tony is that then he would, he would go on and work the material. You would start reforming it. You'd start working with him. He'd give constructive notes. And that's something that I tell people or try to like explain to people. And I think that people should know about him and something I do, you know, kind of wish they had said in Roadrunner too, is like, he's Tony was a, you go on his Wikipedia and it's like celebrity chef. And it's like, yeah, that's not how I think of him. No, 
and he wasn't that great of a chef. It's also just that label doesn't, I, and I didn't know him at all, but the, yeah. the label doesn't make any sense. Yeah. It sounds so hollow to me, given the breadth of what he did also. Right, 100%. To me, what he was more than anything else within my sphere of working with him was he was a, a absolutely incredible television producer. And he understood story. He understood story structure. He understood cinematography. He understood using the tools of film to make something that was cinematic. Even though we were on, you know, making our little show on TV, it was like it always wanted to be a feature film. And so we were using like our limited resources to get as close to that benchmark as possible. It should look beautiful. The framing should be great. The lighting should be great. You know, the music needs to be great. The editing, the pace, the buildup, the way that you present subjects, you know, all, all of that stuff needs to be at the highest level. And that's what people are seeing. I, I think when they respond to the show and the kind of response that the show has gotten, which is really incredible, they're seeing a couple things. Authenticity, because we never did shit twice. We never faked anything. That's all real. Everything you see is real. We didn't set up shots. We didn't call cut. We didn't call action. We got fast. We did what he told us to do. We got fast. So you see authenticity and you see just a very, very high level of production value given our resources. And I think it's something that something that I constantly want to point out to people is like, look at the weight classes that we were punching in. We were way out of our group. You know, I got, we're going out on shows where we're shooting for seven days in the field. We had, we had a $3,000 external equipment rental budget <laughs> and we're getting cinematography nominations. My last cinematography nomination was up against free solo. <laughs> It was up against free solo. <laughs> We're punching way out of our class. And that was because of the very high standards. And that can only come from the top. Yeah. We were down with it because over the time, he was powerful enough and the, the show was magnetic enough to pull in people who were very talented, who were gifted, who really wanted to do like good work and push the genre as far as they could. But that comes from the top, and that was that was Tony, and that was that's what you get from that impeccable nature of like, no, everything needs to be good, and also you just Tony was so fucking cool that you really wanted to please him. On my wall, I have framed the best email I ever got from him. It was when I sent him the first act of the Nigeria show in, that we shot in Lagos, and it just says out fucking standing with two exclamation points and then under it, it says couldn't be happier <laughs> and i framed it and i put it on my wall that is so cool maybe that tells you a little bit i mean that's like the highest moment of my career so <laughs> you know there, there are two things and there are many others but two things that jump to mind as i'm listening to you describe all this you know the first is that when you watch roadrunner yeah and i'd never seen any of this archival footage but it took a while for Tony to find the path to express himself authentically in front of cameras, right? It wasn't yeah. immediate. It wasn't automatic. Yeah. It took some screwing around and throwing a lot against the wall to get there. And when I think of some of my favorite episodes, and I don't know if you were on this particular episode I'm going to reference, but there are many examples of this. The, the authenticity of things going totally sideways and him being really fucking pissed off and having yeah. the writing chops to actually make it into a super entertaining scene. Are you talking about the Sicily show? I think it was Sicily with, with the <laughs> octopus and the guy yep. throwing the octopus. Can you, okay, tell, <laughs> that's funny. You and I have never talked about this, no. and you knew exactly <laughs> what I was thinking about. Yeah, it's the best example of it. So please tell this story because it's so fucking hilarious. Oh my God. Well, I wasn't there. It was directed by Sally Freeman, who's an incredible director and one of my like favorite fucking people in the world. She is just this ass-kicking salty brit 
who doesn't take any shit from anyone. <laughs> She's the only person I've ever seen be able to refer to Tony as shit cakes to his face <laughs> without being summarily fired, <laughs> which in and of itself is a tremendous achievement. I literally saw her in Finland in the hotel lobby say to the group, where's shit cakes with Tony standing right behind her and then turned around and she says, oh, there you are. So <laughs> hats off to Sally. She must have been good at what she did. Yeah. She was directing that, and I and I don't think that that, that wasn't premeditated on her part. I mean, they were going to go out, they were going to dive for her octopus, but I think she, as I recall, she said that like she kind of knew they were fucked when they got there because it's like a it was like a popular beach. There's like tons of people in the water. It's like this whole thing. The guy shows up, you know. They go, they're putzing around in the water looking for octopus. Or of course, there are no octopus there because the water on that beach was probably twenty percent urine. <laughs> And all of a sudden, so the way Tony described it, and we talked to him, we were in Tokyo with him like right after this happened. And he's telling us this story. You know, we were sitting in the bar of the Park Hyatt in Tokyo, right where Bill Murray was in, in Lost in Translation, soaking up just being in that space and being like, this is the spot where Bill Murray was. And, t- and Tony's saying like, I, you wouldn't believe it. I was in Sicily. I'm underwater. All of a sudden, this dead fucking octopus floats down to the bottom of the ocean, and I realize what's <laughs> happening is because the the other diver goes and claims the octopus, the the dead limp octopus off the bottom of the ocean, and goes to the surface and holds it up as if he's found the <laughs> octopus. So it was a total setup, and I think it was actually a really miserable moment for Tony because he was not when we got to Tokyo, he wasn't like. Oh, I'm going to write this thing and it's going to be great and we're going to figure it out and it's going to be funny. He was like, that was the worst fucking moment of my life. <laughs> he went into like a hole of existential angst. He, as you know, in the show, he goes and he downs like six Negronis after that. Oh, yeah. He just fucks off and walks down the beach and just gets beyond hammered. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. He was genuinely bummed. And the reason he was genuinely bummed is because he felt like it was a breach of of exactly what we were talking about, of that authenticity, you know? And the thing that had really been the most important trading capital of the show up until that point was, you know, well, not up until that point. I mean, there are other examples of that. and That certainly didn't break that. But he, but he was bummed about it. I, think it. I think it's also a testament to Sally that she was able to say, hey, no, this is, there's something here that's like really funny and really worth exploring. And then he wrote to it and it ends up being this iconic scene. Lots of people talk about it, but what you're seeing there is a real response from Tony. He was genuinely bummed out. So let me come back to the quote framed on your wall for a second. Yeah. And this is, this is going to be a bit of a non sequitur from what we were just talking about. The uh, plop, 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 as I recall, the voiceover was something like plop, plop. And then I realized what was happening. (laughs) These poor dead octopi are being thrown into the water around him. Are there any particular quotes, poems, books, memorabilia, could be anything that that you have found to be meaningful enough to revisit more than once? Could be anything. I'm just thinking about this letter on your, this email on your wall. Did I keep around my house? Do you keep around your house or that you keep inside your head? Could be anything. It's full of stuff. (laughs) Yes. This is... The piece of paper that he was typing. We needed a scene of when we did the Tangiers episode, we needed a scene of him typing. Mm-hmm. Right? Yep. And so he's typing, and we're just filming him type, and this is what he wrote. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times. Call me Ishmael. This is the saddest story ever told. Jackie Brown at 26, with no expression on his face, said he could get some guns. You're watching CNN. You're watching Mind of a Chef. You're watching Treme on HBO. You're watching The Layover. You're watching repeats of No Reservations. So this is him just freestyle typing. I don't know why I picked it up. It's, it's on my wall. <laughs> my life is full of these. I have shit everywhere from just stuff that I picked up when we were on the road with Tony. It was like an Adobe brick from Marfa. I have a muzzle brick from West Virginia. You know, I have a lighter that Josh Homey gave us when we did the 
a show with Queen of the Stone Age. You know, just collected crap everywhere. I'll narrow it down. So let's assume family, any pets, photo albums, all of that is in the clear, but house is burning down. You can take three to five of these many items that you have. <laughs> Fuck it. Let it burn. <laughs> let it all burn. Okay. All right. That's a fair answer. We're more in the spirit of Tony. I'm, I'm probably grabbing the Emmy. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, man. You know, honestly, it, all jokes aside, it all means something to me. Like, these are the things I decorate my house with. These are the things I want around. This is the greatest thing I ever got to do in my life was be with Tony, to travel the world with Tony, to see a world that a tiny handful of people get to see because the price of admission as a civilian as someone who just wanted to go out and do those things would be so extraordinarily high that you just, you, you can't achieve it. It wasn't like, Oh, we, you know, we got to go on some sweet vacations. It wasn't like, Oh, I have the money to go to the Maldives and stay in like a sick resort. It, it wasn't like that. We had access. We had things that no one else will ever get because of who Tony was. And that is why this shit is special to me. You cannot do this again. This is not replicable. And mm. I think it's actually a lesson that the TV industry needs to learn because I hear a lot of, it's the Bourdain of this. It's the Bourdain of that. It's the Bourdain of that. And you're like, no, it's not. Because the first word you're using is Bourdain and that is gone. And it's not coming back. Yeah. We got to stop trying. You know, this was a singular experience. And I think I think we're all very aware of that. So yeah, I decorate my house with the detritus of traveling the world with Tony, and I'm fucking proud of it. I have junk all over my house. So Tony, and we don't have to we don't have to explore this. It's going to segue to a question about you. Tony obviously had things in his sort of psychological, psycho emotional bag, as I think you mentioned earlier. You do. Yeah, we, and we all have our our demons of different types. You know, f battles we're fighting that no one knows about, or maybe only a few people know about. For the anxiety and bipolar disorder and so on, what have you found to be most effective in terms of tools or behaviors or anything at all for helping with those things for you? So work in progress, you know, bipolar. I mean, you can, uh, I, I'm not, I'm, I'm still trying to go unmedicated. I don't want to go on a, on a mood stabilizer. They're pretty, pretty heavy. Consistency is, is really important. It's a hard thing to do when you're traveling the world is, is have a consistent schedule. But having a consistent schedule, I, I have no proof of this. This is probably this probably gets into your world and your expertise a lot more than mine, but I find techno. I listen to a lot of techno, really a Bluetooth head, and I will listen to seven eight hours of techno straight while I work, and it's like a metronome for my head. It keeps me planted on task, clean. Yeah. So those things, exercise, eating right. All of those, those are the ways that I'm trying to deal with, with my bag. But yeah, we all have them. Tony definitely had plenty of them. But I also think that most of the people on our crew did. You know, we kind of like were a, a collection of like minds. And I don't want to speak for anyone, but I think what we found in the end when we kind of looked around the room, and these are the people in my life that I like, I hold with like the, the highest regard and like the greatest value that. We were all people who had strong creative capacity and we're all, for one reason or another, kind of, I don't want to say that island of misfit toys because it's so corny, but it, <laughs> it's, it, you know, it's got kind of an element of that. You know, everyone was kind of had like a thing that was broken and, and a thing that they were struggling with. And you kind of knew those things, but the, but those that brokenness and, and the kind of pain that comes out of that, I think, was critical 
in terms of looking at the world through the lens that we were trying to look at the world through where we were trying to see everything. We were trying to see the beauty. We were trying to see the pain. We were trying to see all of it. That's not a formulaic show. That's not a show that like everything's going to end happy every time. It's not a show where you're going to hit happy beats every time. It's not like an upbeat travel show where we're like, oh, today we're, you know, it's, it's not. It was, it, was a, it was an exploration of the world in, in all of the permutations of what that means. And if you don't understand pain, you don't understand fear, you don't know those things, you are never going to be able to see it. You're not going to be able to see it. And I, and I don't mean to be dismissive of anyone, but I remember we, you know, at one point we had a new editor coming on for a show and I talked to him for 10 minutes on the phone and I asked him a few questions. What's your favorite shows? What's your life like? What are your hobbies and stuff like that? And I called our showrunner, Sandy Zweig, and I said, I'm sorry, I, I, this isn't going to work. And she's like, why? And I was like, he's, he's too fucking happy. His life's too good. <laughs> his, everything's okay with him. And, and he's not going to get it. Mm. And he didn't. And that wasn't prophetic on my part. It was just knowing that we had to embrace those things. And so, you know, you get to the end and what happened happened. And, all of those things. And, we, and there's a lot of different ways to analyze that. But what's, I think, important to note is that those, those things, those, that experience of pain and, and, and dealing with those things was a critical part of making the show. And it came with a lot of shit that we were kind of all hot to trot on at the time, but I, that I look back and I'm like, Ugh, you know, a lot of alcohol, Tim. Like, there was a lot of like, you know. And I'll speak only for myself. There was a lot of, I mean, almost daily. I mean, yes, daily. Just drink yourself to sleep. Wake up in the morning, hammer fucking coffee. Go on adrenaline and caffeine as far as you can, and then start drinking again, and come down. And that was, that was the rhythm of the gear shifts every day and that's kind of how we got through it why did you stop drinking when when tony died is it because you felt that was maybe a contributing factor was it for other reasons and i'm not asking you to speculate i just love to hear hear your thinking you know what your experience was i want to be careful about not speculating i want to be respectful to you and everyone in tony's sphere i will say this it is impossible for me to separate alcohol from Tony's death. And, and that's kind of a reality for me is like, and I, and I, and I feel like, you know, other people on the show felt that way as well. Again, I don't want to speak for them. There's a lot of people involved in this. There's a lot of people that have their own journeys. There are people who are a lot closer with Tony than I was, but I was fairly close with him. And after he died, I, I could not separate alcohol from from his death i don't mean in a i don't mean that he died because he had been drinking i just mean that that was part of the calculus uh for sure it was in there and it's a dangerous drug and it's severely underestimated in our culture you know and uh and i, I just couldn't do it anymore i like couldn't and i went hard for a long time what did that process look like for you uh, removing that stop drinking <laughs> was it easy i mean was it hard to not it was frantic tell me more yeah i stopped drinking i got a mountain bike and like i i, I swear for the first couple months i was riding i was riding every night i was riding 20 miles a night up on the fire roads outside of my house and this <laughs> is in the months after tony died and I would ride from my house up to the Nike station on Dirt Mall Holland and back. And it's, it's, you know, 10 miles each way. It's not the hardest 10 miles. I'm not like, you know, I don't think I'm Lance Armstrong. I'm definitely not Lance Armstrong. But that's where I was. And I was alone at night riding and just trying to, I don't know, trying to make sense of shit. It was dark right after. The month after he died, I went pretty hard. 
I woke up on my lawn one night. You mean went hard drinking? Yeah, like I drank like a bottle of tequila. I woke up on my lawn, scared myself. I mean, I have two young kids. And I was like, this is this this must end. Good for you, man. Yeah, a lot of people do it. Yeah, and 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 they all need credit. It's a, it's it's a hard thing to uh, to do. Yeah, let me ask you a related question. As I as I watched Roadrunner, which is yeah, it's a I thought it was well done. I'm sure it's imperfect, but there were some takeaways that seemed to takeaways or perspectives that seemed to be shared by more than one person. And one of them was that when Tony was doing jujitsu seriously, he was in one or perhaps in one of the better places, like psycho emotionally speaking. Yeah, definitely. Parallel with that. I'm thinking about something you said earlier in this conversation that I, I just want to highlight because I'm not sure people understand just what it requires. And that is running through the wilderness with a 50 pound backpack with a camera on your shoulder, being able to use one hand. And maybe the technology has changed, but when you and I were spending time together and I was able to watch you film, this is not an iPhone that you're using to film. I mean, this is a, this yeah. is a significant rig on I don't know how much it weighs. I mean, what, I, what, what would you say at the time? I don't know, 20, 20 plus pounds for sure, I would imagine. Yeah, probably 20 plus pounds. We were on slightly bigger cameras for Tim Ferriss' experiment, though, than yeah. what we use like with Meat Eater. Meat Eater was slightly smaller cameras, but it doesn't really matter. It's incredibly physical. Yeah, it's very physical. There were days we were doing 15 miles of backcountry. That, that that may not sound like a lot that's that's a fair amount when you're doing it day to day when you're in snow when you're in environments that that you know, you're not on a trail you're in backcountry you know there's a lot of I, again i'm not trying to pretend like i'm super rugged but it definitely took some doing you're pretty rugged man i mean i don't want to <laughs> you know overstate it but you're pretty rugged and where i was going with that is you know you've been very physical which I would, uh, you know, I'm speculating, but I would imagine that's been good medicine for you to be that active. A hundred percent. Yeah. What are your versions of jujitsu? Like the activities that seem to nourish you and counterbalance maybe some of these things that you're carrying in your bag, right? The anxiety, the bipolar, et cetera. When would people say you are at your best? What type of activities? What are my hobbies? <laughs> yeah sure surfing mountain biking and i was really into racquetball for a long time but i my knees are kind of my knees been a little tough on me with racquetball you know those things for me when you're doing them you're not doing anything else you know surfing's got a, a solitary element to it that's almost like meditation doesn't even matter if you're really catching waves i mean that's like a bonus but you're sitting there you have the rhythm of the ocean you're thinking you're processing things but you're on liquid you know and you're staring out at the ocean waiting for waves it's it's unbelievable i mean it's very very centering and there's a reason that there are stereotypes of of surfers you know it's true you get a (laughs) surfer tone to you i like mountain biking because it's it's really physical it's a it's like a real grind it really pushes your heart rate but when also when you're doing like, you know, like I said, I like the kind of enduro style stuff. You got a lot of shit coming at you fast and you're making a lot of calculations, <laughs> a lot of decisions. You know, I, I like that. It's very dynamic and I tend to like solitary kind of sports. Racquetball is just fast and and it's and it's if for anyone who knows racquetball, it's it's a killer game. You know, you're looking for kill shots. You're you're playing strategy. You're playing geometry, and looking for opportunities to to execute kill shots. And it's a blast. I don't know. I like aggressive shit, and I like shit that like keeps your heart rate way up. All right, I'm gonna use the door that was just opened by the use of the word geometry, and then we're gonna go to muzzle break in West Virginia because we made a. I promised earlier to come back to West Virginia. Yeah. But I I mentioned the dance. I remember watching, and this is segueing into the geometry, and you really need kind of two players in the game, maybe, to to fully visualize this. At least. Yeah, at least, which is why I wanted to mention Marcus Lehman, 
who was also working on Tim Ferriss experiment, great guy, very skilled. Yep. And watching the two of you guys dance with geometry was so fun to the extent that it was almost not distracting, but I was so intrigued and almost just puzzled by how you guys could pull it off. So for someone who has no idea what the fuck I'm talking about, could you just explain how geometry plays into what we were doing or what you would do with Steve and so on? So if you picture it in a, in a basic sense, right? Say you have two characters who are talking to each other. They're standing in a room and they're facing each other. This is like very simple you know, kind of, this is a very simple setup, right? We are not a scripted show. There is no script, right? We need to capture as much of that conversation for the edit as possible in real time. When you're on a scripted show, you can shoot one camera on one angle of that conversation, and then you can move the camera to the other angle of that conversation and shoot the other side, right? So you're shooting one character first, you move and you shoot the other character. When we're doing documentary stuff, you can't do that. You need to get it in the moment. So we have at least two cameras, right? And so one camera is shooting one angle on, you know, character A and one camera is shooting the other angle on character B, right? Now, that's the basic setup. And you could just stand there and you could be in one frame size and whatever, and you could cover the conversation and the editor will cut back and forth between those two cameras as they see fit, but it's going to be boring. Like you, you, you want to add dynamics. So you're going to need to add movement to that scenario. You're going to need to move your characters around the room. You're going to need to allow them to go on some kind of endeavor. You know, you're going to need to, they need to accomplish some goal. They need to do whatever. So they start moving. And now the geometry is always changing, right? Now you need to be shooting both sides of that interaction. You also need to be shooting your insert shots. You need to be shooting wider shots that give you a context of the environment. You need to be shooting all of the supporting footage that tells you where you are and what those characters are doing. And you need to have that in your head and you can't talk out loud. I can't like, I, I mean, I can talk on the walkie, you know, a little bit to the other camera operator, but when you're really doing it well, you know, and I guess again, there's a million different ways to do this. So there's all kinds of different ways that people achieve this, but when you're doing it really well with someone who really knows what they're doing, you know, and in, inherently I know because of the action, because of where the other camera is standing. I know what their shot is. I know where their lens is. I know where their background is. I know where not to cross into their shot. I know what they have. So you're simultaneously watching them and understanding what they're covering and where they are. And you're reacting to that or you're establishing your shot and they're reacting to you, right? When it's really good, it moves that way without conversation. And after you shoot with someone for a while, you really get into a rhythm where you both know what the other person has. You know what the other person's shooting. And as your characters move around the world, as they do their you know, thing, you know how to move together to maintain that coverage. There's a variable in that which dictates a lot of this, which is called the 180-degree rule, right? So picture this. There's a car moving along a bridge, right? And you are shooting from a helicopter out on the passenger side of the car, tracking along with it, right? You can picture that? Got it. I can. The direction of the car, then, if you're doing that, is moving from frame right to frame left, right? That is the way that the action moves. If you then cut to a shot from the driver's side, tracking along, Oh, wait a second. Let, let me, could, could you say that one more time? So I'm imagining in my head, right. I'm in the helicopter. Passenger side. It's so much easier when you can draw it out. Passenger side is on the right-hand side of the car. Passenger side is on the right-hand side of the car, right? Right. And you're moving along with them and the car is going along. And so when you see that shot on the screen, the car is moving in a direction that is from the left-hand side of the screen. Left sorry. side. Left side, I messed it up. Left-hand side of the screen to the right-hand side of the screen, right? Got it. The car is pointed to the right. Now, if you 
go and you switch over and you shoot from the driver's side, what direction is the car going when it goes on screen? It's going the opposite. It's going right to left. You've crossed the 180 degree line. I don't believe like, you know, a lot of these rules are just set up to be broken, right? So there's a lot of variables in there. But in a basic sense, you are confusing your audience because the car that was going left to right is now going right to left. And that is confusing when you're following the continuity of an edit. The same thing with a conversation. If you are, if you have two characters and the cameras are standing on the same side of those characters, you have one character which is looking screen direction left, right? And then you mm-hmm. have one character that's looking screen direction right, and you're cutting in between of those. Now, if one of those characters, if one of those cameras crosses that line, you now have two characters either looking screen direction right or screen direction left. And when you try to cut between them, it won't make sense because they both look like they're looking away from each other, right? Yeah. It's like when it's done well, you don't notice it. But when it's screwed up, you really notice. And That's right. I was watching a super high budget scripted show. I'm not going to mention the name. And they messed this up. It was like a bunch of royalty seated at a long table on one side having a conversation. And it was so confusing to my brain that it was uncomfortable. I think what people don't appreciate a lot is that you need to establish the geometry of your environment in order for, uh, for people to understand what's going on in a physical sense when you're in a scene, right? There's a lot of tricks to doing that. And there are some things that you can do that break that. And that's one of the things that you can do that breaks that. So, but now picture you have two characters who are now like, I keep thinking of the, the, the one we did in Vegas, right? Yeah. What did we call that episode? It wasn't uh, the gambling one. It was, we did two in Vegas. We did, uh, we did the poker, the heads up poker. Not and poker. Then we did the evasive driving. Evasive. Yes. Or evasive tactics, right? Because it was also right. on foot. It was getting out of that's zip right. ties and. Yeah, exactly. So you have two characters moving around in a dynamic environment there, and they're constantly crossing each other. They're constantly crossing the line. They're constantly moving around. Now, you need to know where that 180-degree line is all the time, and both your cameras need to be tuned up enough to move with that line and reestablish that line without thinking about it and without talking. And that's the dance that you're seeing. So when you talk about Mm -hmm. the dance, the dance is really maintaining that coverage in a way that is going to make sense for the editor and ultimately make sense for the audience. And it is difficult to learn. And once you do learn it, like with anything else that's fun to do, it's a blast. It's really cool to work with someone that understands how that works. I don't know if this is the schedule we had was was normal. If it is, I don't know how the hell you guys do it for so long. Pretty normal. Yeah, I yeah, I remember we had whatever it was, like 13 weeks of shooting and it was like five or six days of shooting, a half a day to a day of transition to another location if necessary and then you're right back into shooting. Yeah. And then I, then I was reviewing rough cuts and so on at night, which was just a really Incredible introduction to the velocity of <laughs> that type of production. Yeah. Uh, but it, but what I was going to say is it also makes it sometimes hard to remember because they were moving pieces and sometimes people wouldn't be available for a week or two. Were you on the New York City episode with Josh Waitzkin and Maurice Ashley? Yeah, that was amazing. Yeah. So I want to mention one scene because it's, it's A, it's a super fun scene, but it also demonstrates how well shooters can dance this dance in a complex environment. And you probably know where I'm going, but this is Grandmaster Maurice Ashley playing this hustler, the trash talker. I loved it. Oh my God. It's one of my favorite things I've ever seen. It's incredible. And people can find this clip actually on the YouTube channel for Grandmaster Maurice Ashley. And I, don't, I want to see how many views it has now. It's got, yeah, 9 million views. This is just <laughs> such an incredible scene in Washington Square Park. Yeah, it was amazing. So maybe you could just walk us through, since this is a real world example, right? If you recall, just what were some of the considerations? What was happening? Because we're sitting in Washington Square Park. It's freezing out. Like people are wearing their winter clothing. And this is where, well, A, you know, Josh Waitzkin, who was the basis for searching for Bobby Fisher, both the book and the movie. Yeah. 
played as a little kid. It's where, in the details from Maurice Ashley, it's where the the late great Vinny Livermore used to beat my ass at the same table. <laughs> this is from yeah. him. Uh, maybe you could just, if you remember any of the experience, just kind of walk through because this is complex. This is this is. It seems to me, at least, like hard to get right, and it just came out so so well. So I don't remember the specifics of the blocking. I remember it was one of the coolest things that I've ever seen because you had this grandmaster chess player sit down with a New York City street hustler and listen. Though I mean, I don't know shit about chess, but I know that those New York City street hustlers are damn good chess players and they play fast. Yeah, they can play. And we watched a grandmaster sit down and devour this cat as if he just didn't even exist. And also return fire with shit talking in equal measure, right? That's right. And called him out when he tried to when he tried to knock the pieces over and hustle him. Yeah. It reminded me there was a famous quote, I forget the name of the Crow Scout who was working with the U.S. Cavalry when Custer was decimated at Little Bighorn, but they asked him after how long it took, and he said, about as long as it takes a hungry man to eat a sandwich. <laughs> and that's how he described Custer getting taken down at Little Bighorn, and that's how I would describe that Grandmaster running through that cat. He <laughs> fucking devoured him. It was so satisfying to watch. Not because I have anything against the street hustler, by the way, but just to see someone that proficient at something was incredible. Oh, it was great, yeah. I don't remember the specific blocking, but this is what I would say in remembering that scene and in thinking about how I would go into that, right? So you know a couple things going in. You know that it's going to be all about their the energy between them, right? And so you're looking at tight shots of eyes. You're looking at like establishing their, their connection and establishing the board. And you have two things going on. The connection between them, right? in the shit talking and all that stuff. And then what's going on in the board and you got to cover what's going on on the board too. And then you have the crowd around them. I'm getting to that part, right? I'm getting to that part because you in their dynamic, you need to cover the game, right? You need to cover the game, but you need to be quick enough to know that you got to get up to the two shot. You also got to establish the environment, right? And part of the environment and part of what you know is going to tell the story is the reaction of the people that are standing around. So you got to get out to those wide shots, got to see where the crowd is, got to see where, where you know, kind of everyone is placed, right? Got to get in on the details of the game, got to get in on their rapport, and then you got to start searching the audience, the, that crowd that was standing there for the telling reaction shots. And so while I'm standing in an environment like that, I'll be doing my coverage, looking around, and when any moment I get, I'm looking up and I'm like, who's the most expressive here? Who's the person that's going to come out with the big line? Who's the person that's going to... And I think I remember that day someone being like, eventually to the street hustler guy, like, like kind of patting him on the shoulder and being like, do you know, do you know who this is? <laughs> Am I right about that? I feel like he like at one point someone was like, yeah, there, there was, there was definitely a moment. Yeah, there was absolutely. Exactly. And so it's, it's looking, it's looking for that and understanding in two cameras, you know, you know that the people that are on your side of the line, the other camera is going to have them. People that are on the other side of the line, you have them and you're kind of those, that's how you divvy up the responsibility. But if you miss it, you miss it. And remember, these are not actors. You cannot go back. You cannot get those original reactions again. No way. You have to get it in the moment. And that's where it gets back to Tony. And when he said, you be fast. And he was, he was right about that. And it pissed a lot of people off. A lot of people would come onto the show and be like, this is fucked. We don't like get time to set up. We don't get something to do that. And I'd be like, dude, you are not cut out for this show. Or not just dude. A lot of women in our line of work too. But you are, you're not going to make it here. Because what you don't understand is that you're fucking it up by trying to get it right. Yeah. You got to learn how to not miss it the first time. And, and it might not be perfect and it might not be pretty, but you got to get it. And that's so that's how I would, that's how I would think about a scene like that. The most important element being that it doesn't happen again, it happens once. Yeah. hundred percent. And what made that scene also it was a great scene. so gratifying is that Maurice is like a handsome, charismatic. Yes. Morpheus in yeah. a black leather he jacket like Morpheus. and can also just murder people on the chessboard and trash talk 
really well. So it's so fun. We'll put a we'll put a link in the uh, in the show notes. Yeah, that's worth watching. So what I'm pulling up, you may never guess who I texted. So I texted uh, John Badolis and Chris Vivian. Yeah. And so John directed a ton of these uh, Tim Ferriss Experiment episodes. And so I, I asked him what topics and questions he thought might be fun to explore. <laughs> okay. This is going to be interesting. He has some good ones. And I'll, I'll start with... And, and there are many different ways we could go here, but like from DP to director to showrunner, what skills or habits do you find help most in transitioning from a more narrowly creative role to a broader creative role with more managerial responsibilities? Yeah. So there, there are many ways to approach this. I mean, I suppose the, the simplest way would just be to say, what advice would you give to someone who is really technical and good at one thing, right? They deliver. They're really exceptional. And they hope to embrace, or they're being asked to embrace, a role that is broader with managerial responsibilities. Like, what would you, what advice would you give to your younger self as you were doing that, or to someone else who's in a similar position? Get ready to relinquish control because if you don't, you're going to smother the people who are working under you. You need to trust them and you need to be able to work with the people who need work in a proactive manner to get them to the place where you need them to be because you are not going to be able to control everything anymore. When you have the camera in your hand, you have this tiny little world in the viewfinder and you can control every aspect of it. As you start to climb the ladder up to directing and then to show running, you need to depend on other people. So part of that is bringing good people in. The other part is understanding when you need to let people do their job well, let's get super specific. So this, I would imagine, is super hard for people who are very proficient in something they are now supervising, right? Like that's you were correct. talking about with the, with the DPs, right? And you're just like, you sure that's the right shot? Like, why don't you move over a little bit? Yeah, I think yeah. Maybe, why not, maybe a little tighter. So does it mean just picking your battles well and like letting things go that you can let go, but holding a really strong line on certain quality decisions where you need to push a little bit. I, I, I just love to hear, because it doesn't sound easy to just like flip no, a switch. I don't think it is either. It, and I think it took me some time. And I had times when I blew up at camera operators or DPs that I really regret because it was like exactly the wrong way to go about things, you know? And I had, I had a DP who I really, really respect. We had a pretty vicious exchange in the field one time and he came to me after and he's like dude he's like you took what was just a lovely delightful day where we were getting great stuff and you fucking murdered it over a detail and and you've ruined the whole vibe of of the day and the shoot and that was really profound for me and i thought about that a lot for what because like he missed a shot like i knew was there I know I was right. I know the shot was there. I knew the shot would make the edit. I knew it was important. Why I had to rip his head off about it, I have no idea now. I don't do that anymore. So I think that one aspect is just finding ways to approach what you need to get in a way that's positive and proactive. We worked with Angelo Dundee when we were doing Ali. Angelo Dundee's I mean, to just fill everyone in who doesn't know, Angelo Dundee was Ali's trainer. He was one of the great boxing trainers of all time. So you want to talk about a level of expectation <laughs> and perfection. I mean, that is operating at the very highest level of that. But he wouldn't come in and be like, hey, dude, your, your jab sucks. And like, what the fuck? Why am I wasting my time? And blah, 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 all this stuff. He would come to Ali and he'd be like, hey, you know, I was watching your jab. You're doing really good with that jab. I love the way that you're doing this. Even if it was something that Ollie wasn't doing, he was trying to point out something to, to, get, a, to get a response, mm -hmm. to get him to focus on a particular aspect of that movement. You know, And I think that that's really important in, in finding ways to work with people and say... Get what you want in a way that is a little smarter than just coming out and just hammering folks. So what might you have said to that guy, the, the, the newer version of you? How might you have handled that situation? In retrospect now, mm -hmm. 
I think the number one thing is I, I like I would stay calm. I didn't stay calm in that moment because I was kind of dying because I knew I needed a shot. But I think I would stay calm and say, hey, listen, like this is happening right now. You need to break off, let go of what you're doing. Don't worry about the shot that you're on. We're fine on that. I got it in post, but we need this right now. I think that's a pretty easy explanation, you know? Yeah. But we tend not to do that because we're so controlling that in the moment it feels like, you know, it feels like you're losing control. And that's not the truth. I think that as you as you get older, you get more experience with management. Unless you're going to be a Jim Cameron or a Michael Mann, unless you're going to be a tyrant, which trust me, that's 20 hours a day of work, hard work. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not that and I'm not going to do it. And I never was. And I don't want to treat people like that. And, and listen, no shade on them. What they do is unbelievable. But I think I know myself enough now to know that that's not how the style and how I'm going to accomplish what I need to accomplish. I think it's building people up now and saying like, I trust you. Think about it this way. Think about it this way. Try this. You know, I know from experience, I can tell you that this, this is going to work, but I don't know, being willing to work with people. So let's come back to that muzzle break on your shelf. Right. Maybe you can explain what a muzzle break is to people. And then <laughs> let's talk about the, the return to West Virginia and why it matters. A muzzle break, first of all, it's a way to dispense the energy of the bullet coming out of of the gun it it can provide accuracy and and safety by basically pushing the energy of firing the bullet out to the sides right mm -hmm. this muzzle break was made by jmac customs in west virginia which is cool because they're a they're an independent operation which takes people who you know were laid off in coal mines and various other extractive industries that have left West Virginia and puts them to work and trains them as machinists I mean they do high quality work I'm not particularly into guns but I respect what they're doing and I'll probably get a little bit of commentary online about my understanding of the dynamics of muzzle brakes but <laughs> <laughs> that's what I know that's what the internet's for yep West Virginia, for me, you know, and this is a very personal story, so if everyone can bear with me, like West Virginia for me was the most important thing that, that I ever did. And I'm, when I say West Virginia, I'm, I'm like talking about the, the parts unknown episode of West Virginia. I had lived in West Virginia when I was a kid and my family went through a pretty tough time when we were there. Parents were, you know, kind of on the rocks. West Virginia can be a tough place, especially in that time. You know, it's a place that's been hit really hard by by the dynamics of of extractive industries and capitalism. And listen, I'm not bitching about capitalism. Like I believe in I believe in capitalism, maybe not our particular form of it, but for the most part I believe in it. But you have a state that was really predicated on the coal industry. And as soon as they found easier cheaper coal in china and in wyoming they just dropped those people like they didn't even exist and so it created a tough environment and i grew up to some degree in west virginia in in an environment that was kind of tough we didn't have running water electricity etc there's also some things i remember about it that are very fond but it was like a really formative moment in my life and i had really bad associations with west virginia for a long time and wouldn't, you know, I just wouldn't think about it, wouldn't go there. I went back in 2003 after I stopped working for Michael Mann and I happened to be there in Southern West Virginia when there was really bad flooding. And I saw these people and had this moment where I was just like, these, this, like you're talking about like the heart and soul of America. Especially when you get down to Southern West Virginia, that is a, a mixed group of white folks, black folks, who came to that area to build lives for themselves and in the process built this country. And we basically shit on them. We engage in these ridiculous hyperbolic stereotypes of who they are. We consider them 
to be uneducated and and i mean how many jokes do you know about hillbillies it's not true <laughs> these are like the hardest working most independent rugged self-determining people and that's the reason they went to those mountains in the first place they are the heart of who we're supposed to be as a country you know and i think we've seen and i don't want to dive into politics here, but I think we've seen the result of what happens when you shit on those people and you ignore them. They get fucking angry and they got a right to, you know, I always wanted to go back and make a show from what I saw there and the hardships that those folks were going through. And so we were in Antarctica with Tony and I pitched him on a West Virginia show and he was stoked on doing it. And so I got to go, you know, we got to go back to the town of Welsh in McDowell County. McDowell County is the county, it's the highest percentage population loss in the United States for any county over the past 50 years. It's a place that's just been like decimated. It's always number two or three on the most impoverished counties list in the United States. And we went there and I had this moment where I was like, like, you know, I'm like taking Tony to a place where there's no restaurants, there's no food, you know, it's like literally a food desert. Is he going to like, is he going to connect with this place? Is he going to see what I feel like I saw, which was what I feel like we were kind of always looking for to some degree in the show, which was like the beauty that's underneath that surface level, you know? And we went there, we, we go through the first couple of days of shooting and then Tony starts tweeting. Like these tweets, like nothing, you know, moves me like this place. It's just all these like really beautiful, wonderful. And like, and I had this moment where I was like, yeah, dude, it's Tony, man. Of course he gets it. Of course like he gets what, what you're trying to show him. Of course he gets these people in this place. And I think it was so important because it showed, you know, on a show called Parts Unknown, we're going to like central Appalachia in the United States. I think it showed his ability to walk into a context and environment. This is right after Trump was elected, by the way, you know, to walk into a context and environment and see people for who they really are, not who, what our perception of them is not based on his political feelings, not based on anything, but the, just the evidence of sitting down with someone and, and saying like, what, what are your values? What does life mean to you? What do you want? What are you looking for? And as soon as he saw who they were, he, he responded to it. We made this beautiful show. It was one of the few shows that we got to do where CNN gave us extra time. They gave us an extended episode. The show won an Emmy. And I sent the Emmy back to Welsh. And it's in Welsh. It's someone's house in Welsh now. Oh, that's amazing. How cool. And it was just for me personally, for me professionally, in every way, it was like, this is, this is full circle. This is how you make peace with something that's painful in your childhood. You go and you confront it and you, you find out what's really there beneath the surface. And then you try to be benevolent about what it is. And I guess that's in part, like now I'm kind of making a, this a little bit of a leap, but you know, looking for, like we said earlier, looking for the gift in something, you know, mm. like here's this thing that was really painful for me as a child, but there was this tremendous gift in it, which was like an understanding of this place and a connection to it that allowed us to go and do something within our own country, looking at ourselves at a time when we critically need it because we are fucking falling apart, if you haven't noticed. <laughs> You know? Yeah, yeah. Anyone who hasn't noticed, man, <laughs> this might be time to take a, take another look at things. But we need to we need to connect with each other. We need to talk to each other. Yeah. You know, we need to be good to each other. How are you choosing the projects that you work on now? And how did you end up becoming involved with United Shades of America? Again, this is like one of those lucky moments where you're like, oh, well, obviously I'm going to do that. You know. We had taken Kamau Bell to Kenya on Parts Unknown. And he, you know, we wanted to do, the, CNN wanted to do a crossover show. Kamau has a Kenyan name, though. And I don't know what his genetic descent is, but probably 
West African, not East African. For those who don't know, who is Kamau? Kamau is a comedian from Oakland, black comedian from Oakland, who has, you know, really, I think, carved out like a niche for himself dealing in identity and cultural issues in the United States, but from a comedic lens, you know, and, and has been someone who's like really been willing to sit down with the other and have honest conversations with them, but do it in a way that is not so heavily laden. Mm -hmm. He's really kind of brilliant at that. Again, I mean, one of these people that I'm so lucky to have the opportunity to work with because he's, he's super smart, super dynamic and is doing something at a time in America where I like really believe we need it, where we are talking about these things head on. His current project, which I had absolutely nothing to do with, is the four-part documentary on Showtime on Bill Cosby. And I think it's really brave of Kamau to come out and like be willing to have that conversation. A lot of people weren't. So that's kind of, that's, that's who he is. We took him to Kenya uh, simply because his name is Kenyan. Like Kamau in Kenya is like Dan here. <laughs> it's just like you look at the phone book and it's like half the people in the phone book are come out you know we went we shot this awesome show there it was so cool went on safari we were like three feet from lions you know and the safari was black rhinos white rhinos hung out with the maasai hung out in nairobi which is an incredible incredible city again with like a really young really vibrant really hard working population that like is another place that is just driving this kind of like i don't you know what how do you how does one even say it i mean africa's on fire right now and i i believe it's the next real growth place i mean with some hot centers around like lagos and nairobi and accra and other places but shot this great show and at the end of it I kind of, with a little bit of scumbaggery producerness, said, "Hey, listen, like, if you're ever dissatisfied with your production company, or if you ever just want to make a change, I shouldn't say dissatisfied because I don't want to put words in his mouth. Uh, we'd love to work with you." And we got a call a year later, and he wanted to, I guess, try something new. So we've been lucky enough to do that. And like, it just, I feel, again, I feel very, very lucky in that because at a time when, again, we're like, we're bleeding, man, this, this like great, incredible country that we have, we're hurting, you know, and we gotta be, we gotta be able to talk about these things with each other without ripping each other's heads off. And more and more, it feels like we're just ripping each other's heads off. So Whereas my life was really focused on like the external world, you know, the world outside of the United States for so many years with Tony, I, I felt like at a time when we really needed to look inward, I got a chance to, you know, I have gotten a chance to do that with Kamau and it's been amazing. Learned a tremendous amount about who we are and have seen some shit that I can't unsee. I feel like it's so hard for us as white Americans to get a glimpse into what it's like to be black in this country. And I will never know that. And I know that I will never know that. But I've been able to see with much clearer resolution than I think a lot of people get to see what that experience is like. And I can't, I can't unsee it now, you know, so for whatever that's worth. Like anyone in Black America gives a shit what I have to say about anything. But well, I mean, be that as it may, as you mentioned, these are hard conversations to have. But if the conversations aren't had, we're fucked. <laughs> I mean, what are we gonna do? Yeah, I mean, then what? Right? What's Plan B in that case? We know what Plan B is. Like all you got to do is read history. You know what Plan B is. You know. Plan B is blood, man. Plan B is not good. Yeah, so better to go with plan A. And I was struck, I didn't know about this, but when you mentioned that Kamau was working on this, you said miniseries for Showtime? or like Yeah, yeah four-part series. Four-part docuseries on Bill Cosby. Yeah, just premiered. And I don't know the content. I don't know the angle. I don't know him. Not referring to Bill, but referring to Kamau. Yeah. But that is a ballsy move very you know that's that that's a bold move and it's 
I applaud that. However, people may feel about Bill Cosby, like it's to make a character study and a historical study of that. I think is it seems important, right? It seems important. We have to talk about it. We want to fix these issues. You have to talk about it, you know. But again, for Kamau, and I don't want to speak out of turn here, but as a as a black comedian. I look at what Bill Cosby did. I mean, Bill Cosby broke more goddamn barriers, you know. Mm-hmm. What he accomplished was amazing. And I and that's why I think that what ended up coming out about Bill Cosby, which is pretty irrefutable, you know, despite the fact that he is now walking the streets free, that is soul crushing. That is hard to face. That is hard to deal with when you've looked at this as a person who has been able to transcend a lot of the boundaries that have have held you down. So I think as a as a black American to do that and to take that on head on is is damn gutsy. I, I think you should be applauded for that, regardless again of of how you feel about Cosby and, and the cases surrounding Cosby in particular. What's next for you? What are you most hoping to do or looking forward to doing in the next few years? I don't know, man. I'm just wait, waiting for crickets to walk by. <laughs> <laughs> waiting for crickets. You seem to have an uncanny ability to wait in the right spots and to pick the right crickets. I must say, you're an excellent spider. You're a fantastic, fantastic spider. I don't honestly know, Tim. I mean, like, it, you know, you want to keep, you want to keep progressing, right? You want to keep building and and keep you know you want to see how far you can go i i think that i'm i'm open man I, i'm like open i want new challenges just like everyone else you know and we'll see where that goes i have another badola's question yeah and i'm gonna read it exactly as he texted it to me because i love the brevity it's almost like a haiku yeah so I've, i would probably re- reword this just because I'm a different person, but I, I, I love it in its current form. So I'm going to read it. Here we go. You work with your wife, period. Potentially loaded situation, period. How do you deal? Question mark. So this is, this is, this is though, I think a question that applies to a lot of people. How have you navigated or made rules around or figured out how to coexist and collaborate with a spouse? Honestly be willing to lose and be honest about like what is right in a particular situation. I I think that we spend so much time. I think a lot of times in relationships, we spend so much time trying to prove that like we're in control and competent. I I think again, it is giving someone the respect to give them space and allow them to take control of a situation. You know, I mean, we do that at home with the kids. We do that in our household, we do it at work, you know? And I don't know, I, I came up with this concept. Well, I didn't come up with it. What the fuck am I talking about? It's, 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 I, I tapped into an age old concept that I feel like has some wisdom to it, which is this idea of strategic loss, you know? Yeah. Like be willing to lose some fucking battles. What are you trying to prove? It's your wife. She's not, I mean, she's not going anywhere. You know, I hope. <laughs> I needed to do a couple of things to make it all work. And this is the this is the life I want, you know. I want to work with my wife. I want to travel around the world with my wife. I want to like be as much a part of helping her build her career as I want to build my own. But it took for me like coming to the point where I had to be like you're going to have to learn how to how to lose not be right about everything give her space let her learn let her teach you and follow through on the shit that you say you're gonna do Mm. and that to me is like number one relationship killer right if we're just talking about the relationships it's like you say you're gonna do something like do it (laughs) yeah don't not do it you're breaking trust you know and when it came down to my wife going back to work after she raised the kids and, you know, went through two home births without medication. I have to mention that because she's rugged as shit. 
<laughs> Match made in heaven for Mo Fallon. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I, I, I said to her, like, if you go back to work, I will learn how to do this stuff. I promise you, I will follow through on my end of holding up the family, my end of the household duties. Learn how to do this stuff. You mean handling, handling the kids and so on? Yeah, it's hard. That was perfect timing. <laughs> yeah, there's a there <laughs> cute kid audio. <laughs> it's sweetheart. I think that that's going to be okay. Um, um, in, um, in the house. Is a daddy long leg in the house? No, on the painting. <laughs> I'll, 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 come, I'll come handle it, sweetheart. I just got to finish this up, though. So give me 10 minutes, okay? Give me 10 or 15 minutes. You don't have to worry about that. I need. I do need some space, though, love. Give me a hug. All right. You say hi to Tim? You say hi to Tim? Hello. Hello. <laughs> Oh, man. You can come play with it after, sweetie. I love you. I'll be in in a sec. I'm so glad I slipped her that 20 to make that appearance (laughs) and talk about spiders. It was perfect. I mean, for me, it was like realizing that, you know, anyone who doesn't think that taking care of kids in the household isn't a full-time professional job is like, it just has not done the work and does not understand what goes into it. Yeah. It is a full-time gig. And like, if my wife was going to go back to work and we were going to have this future where we could work together, like I had to, I had to be willing to ante up. I did. And it made all the difference, but what a dream, right? You know, I mean, yeah. just to put this in perspective a little, and I, I sure, I, I don't, I don't want to cry on my own violin here, but <laughs> you know, when Tony died, Jillian and I had just finished doing, you know, co-directing, co-producing the second sh- Parts Unknown that we made for him. And it was in Florence. It's a show that has not aired. It was never finished. We shot it a week before Tony died. And we were sitting with Tony on the last day and he turned to Jillian and uh, he, you know, he gave her his seal of approval. He said, I, I, I like this. I like working with you. We're going to do this a lot more. I just signed another three years and, uh, and like buckle up, get ready. And that was the last interaction the three of us had together. And Jill and I went home that night and we looked at each other and we're like, we did it. You know, we mm. did it, man. We did. This is the dream. We're on the, we're on the, the coolest fucking show on TV. The best ride you can possibly go on if you're, you know, a sensualist who wants to see the world. This is it. It doesn't get better than this. We're doing it together. We're able to bring our kids. The next show that we talked about potentially doing was in Kyoto. It's like, you know, who doesn't want to do that? We had the dream and we had worked really hard to get there. And a week later, that was gone. And that was a tough blow. And so we've, you know, I don't know, we've just focused in on like, okay, cool. How do we get back there? Hmm. And that's, the, I mean, man, that's so important to me. Yeah. She's also super, super good at what she does. So it makes it easy. Now she's outgrowing me though, because everyone wants her. <laughs> well, quality problems. And uh, sounds like you have, sounds like you both have great co-pilots for kids and daddy long legs and everything in between. Yeah, I'm pretty well. Yeah, man. Well, Mo, let me do this because I know um, you have uh, you have a lot going on over there and we've already been gone for almost three hours. That's so much fun. This is so great, man. It's so wonderful to see you. And I'm so happy to see you doing so well with the family. And is there anything else you would like to say, share, any requests you'd like to make of the audience, any complaints about the podcast you'd like to state publicly? (laughs) Anything at all that you'd like to add before we wind to a close here? Oh, man, there's so many things, you know, like go through, like when we were going to do this, I was just going through all this, these incredible experiences in my mind. It's too much to get into one thing. Yeah. But I did want to talk about one day that I felt like it was like, you know, really the best day of my career. And I feel like really got to typify what the whole experience was about. And then I don't know if this will make the cut or anything. Anyone wants to hear my anecdotes, but you know, we did this this show in Antarctica, which was a huge show for us. And I think was really showed, it was a real expression of what I was talking about. Of like, you can't buy this ride. You got to earn this with something special like that show. We get invited to go down to Antarctica 
I mean, you know now, I, you've been, you know, you fly to Christchurch, uh, hop a C-130 to McMurdo, and then from McMurdo, we, we hopped another C-130 to the South Pole. Like, we had our own C-130. Like, how ridiculous is that? <laughs> like, me and Tony and the rest in the crew, it was uh, actually the show was directed by Eric Osterholm, which I got to, like, give him mad props for getting us down there, and produced by Josh Farrell, who was, like, also just, like, a great producer, and co-DP on that was Fred Minot, who's a gifted cinematographer. And we also had Josh Flanagan, who is uh, one of our other DPs, who's also just gifted on the show. So we have this incredible crew. We had our own friggin' C-130 flying around. And we did this thing where we went out to a place called Dry Valleys, which is it's kind of like the get if you go to Antarctica, you hang out in McMurdo. Dry Valleys is interesting because they've had no precipitation for like, you know, 10,000 years, right? So you're in Antarctica, but it looks like you're in the desert. People don't know this. There's places in Antarctica where there's no snow. Where we were was kind of mixed. You get glaciers and you get like rock, right? So we go have this incredible meal, this crew that's there. We're drinking whiskey out of ice that's... I, I, these little shot glasses they make out of the ice there that's 50,000 years old. Ice in our <laughs> drinks, it's 50,000 years old. There's a beach there next to the... So we're, so we're like sitting on the beach. Tony's playing music as he always would. He would be like the DJ. we drink, shoot a little, play frisbee, shoot the shit, talk. Just kind of soak it up. It's like, you know, bright sunlight, 12 at night. He's, he was playing specifically, he was playing gin and juice. I uh, remember that. <laughs> And we're all just having a great time. We go to sleep, camp out next to the glacier there, and wake up the next morning. And the next morning, we were just going to shoot B-roll. And we get picked up by a helicopter, right? Uh, an A-star. It was piloted by a pilot who had been flying Apaches and Cobras in Afghanistan. And then, like, got to go down and, and be one of these pilots on the ice. But when you're a pilot down there, basically all you do is you either pick up human waste and shuttle it back to McMurdo from these uh, substations, or you're like, you know, ferrying scientists and samples back and forth. Like, you don't really get to do a lot of fun stuff. But then we're like the, the rock and roll crew that comes in, and we get this pilot who's just hot to trot and like, do uh, you want to go see some <laughs> shit? And we're like, yeah, we want to go see some shit. And just took us on a tour of all the craziest shit that he could get to within fuel range of of that substation and like he you know flying through these canyons that no one's ever been in you know fly you up to a cliff that's two thousand feet high the scale of antarctica cannot be described you'd be like we'd be on this cliff that's two thousand feet high looking down into a valley where you could easily fit manhattan with room left that no one's ever touch it's vast beyond belief standing in a place where no human beings ever been hop back in the helicopter and then he'd do some crazy drop off the cliff where you're like weightless for a second go fly around and going through canyons and just everything you ever wanted to do if you ever had a helicopter and a apache pilot to yourself <laughs> and we're filming and filming and filming and eventually we need fuel we stop at this refueling station. There's intermittent refueling stations around. And we're sitting there, surrounded by 55-gallon drums of jet fuel. And these three folks come out, and they are the people who work at the refueling station. And their job is to be out there all season long, right? Refueling choppers. Pretty lonely out there. I bet. At that point, you are living on Hoth, you know? And... They come out with these pulled pork sandwiches, like they made pulled pork sandwiches for us. And we're, so we're sitting there drinking warm coffee, eating pulled pork sandwiches over a 55 gallon drum of uh, jet fuel. The helicopter still hot and just had this moment of this is this is it, man. This is the top for this particular thing that I'm going to do in my life, this particular journey. Nothing is going to get any cooler than this. Nothing is going to get any more singular, inaccessible, or amazing to be able to do those things and see those places and to hope to be able to capture enough of that in an organic enough way 
that it would translate some of what that journey was to people at home who will never be as lucky as I've been to stumble into this thing and to be able to hang out and hang on and and get to that place. That was that was it, man. And like I don't know, it feels kind of selfish to tell that story in a way because it's like, oh, look at the, you know, look at the awesome fucking thing that I got to do. But I actually don't mean it that way. I actually mean like I hope that what we did at the end of the day was was be able to bring some of that back and show people what is out there. It is vast and beautiful and extraordinary and so much bigger than our little daily, you know, kind of day-to-day context and not trying to belittle or trivialize that, but there's something very freeing about the humility that comes with those massive spaces and being able to say like, no one's ever stood here. This ice is 50,000 years old, or this is timeless. This goes so much deeper and beyond me. I don't know. I hope that maybe everyone gets to to experience some degree of that at some point in their life, because I, I think it's really important to be able to feel small. Mm. And ultimately that is what the show did, I guess, for me and like the best way is give me a perspective on what this world really is. Mm. You know, FYI, we should fucking take care of it, you know? Yeah. And don't be so goddamn afraid of other people, man. <laughs> the end of the day, like I keep telling people what I saw out there, you know, seven continents, 70 countries, and a lot of hairy moments, a lot of beautiful moments and a lot of whatever. I, 99% of the people that we encountered were just beautiful, awesome people that wanted to take us into their homes and feed us and, and share their life with us and tell us who they were. And that's the truth of what's out there. There's a lot of othering that goes on in this world and like they're not same concerns, same people, all of them, same shit we're trying to do. Same, same. I don't know if that makes sense. It's kind of a rant. That makes perfect sense. And that I could, I could not have scripted a better place to end. And I'm glad that uh, there's no scripting involved, man. It's uh, the perfect place to wrap up. Mo, it's so nice to see you again. Yeah, man. It was great. Really, really great to see you. Hopefully we can hang out in person at some point here too. Oh, I would love that. I would love that. And people can find you on Twitter at Diamond Mo M O Fallon if let me try that. Yeah. I figure with an F in my <laughs> name, I can say that correctly. At Diamond Mo Fallon. And I already got the Mo part. F A L L O N. Instagram yeah. Fallon dot Morgan. Facebook Morgan dot Fallon dot three one and zero point zero. You can find all spelled out zero point zero dot com. Thank you so much for making the time. Yeah. Come be another one of my uh, disappointed and frustrated social media followers. <laughs> 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 I don't do great on social media. Uh, Oh, that is the perfect way to get people to look at your social. Brilliant. (laughs) Genius. Absolutely genius. And really appreciate you and what you do in the world and the ruggedness and rigor that you bring to what is both incredibly artistic, but, and I saw this when we were working together, also very tender and, and human. It's a gift that you help bring to the world. So thank you for, for doing that. Shit, Tim. I mean, that's, that's an incredible compliment coming from you and everything that you do and, and bring. And I, I think you bring that same humanity to everything that you do. It's like a real marker of your success. So I, I, I mean, listen, I'm humbled, man, by the whole thing. So thank you. Thanks to you, man. And we'll, we'll get together, have some coffee. Maybe go mountain biking on something that isn't like, you know, 45 degree single, single track. Yeah. And I'll let you get to the daddy long legs. And for everybody listening, for links to everything we discussed, everything we talked about and more, I will put that all in the show notes at tim.blog slash podcast. And until next time, be just a little bit kinder than you think is necessary. And thanks for tuning in.